We request, but do not require, that you provide your full name, address, using the forms on the podium in case we have a need to contact you regarding your comment. Okay, with that said, I would like to call to order this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And the time is 6.32 p.m. First item on the agenda. Uh, I think we need to take roll. Excuse me? Oh, yeah. Take roll, please. President Hill. Present. <laughs> Vice President Ackerman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay, thank you. So the first item is changes to the agenda. Does staff have any changes to the agenda tonight? Uh, yes, we'd like to. We'd like to just talk about the change to the packet. To the packet, not. There's no change to the agenda. Correct. Right. There was an updated packet to eliminate any reference to the ballots that had already been collected, so that it was clear that there's no pre determination of how this hearing is going to go and how many ballots will be uh, totaled up this evening. And there was also a, 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 a mistake or, or we missed one spot where we needed to add wastewater rates as well as water rates. Oh, yeah. So that was the, the change to the, the, to the agenda packet. Thank you. So there's, and there's also one correction that's not in the agenda packet is that there is a resolution on that the rate resolution there is um we also need to re add rescinding resolution 12 18 19 which okay. is the wastewater rates resolution okay and that was omitted so we had three resolutions written. we need to add that fourth one so when we get to the motion we may want to add okay. do we need a motion on that right now or? no no, no. Okay. Oral communications. This portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications by the public for any subject that lies within the jurisdiction of the district and is not on the agenda. The water rate increase is on the agenda, so this is not the time for water rate comments yet. Any person may address the board of directors at this time. Normally, presentations must not exceed three minutes in length, and individuals may only speak once. Please understand that the Brown Act limits what the board can do regarding issues not on the agenda. No action or discussion may occur on issues outside of those already listed on today's agenda. Any director may request that a matter raised during the oral communications be placed on a future agenda. Sir. Yes, Don Dietrich. I live at 904 Lockwood Lane in Scotts Valley. I'm a water customer in this district. Yes. On January 4th of this year, my water was abruptly shut off without notice. Now, they were working on the main line a quarter to a half a mile from my house for two, or almost two days. And they abruptly shut the water off without notice. Never noticed the finest when it was going to come back on. And what came out of my cap and into my house looked like sewer water. Now, I, I don't know what regulations you fall under or what you're supposed to do. And I tried to find out by looking on your website, which is atrocious. It's horrible. And when I called to find out why my water was off, it was a snarky attitude. There was an emergency water line break, which can't be an emergency if you're working on it for two, a day and a half to two days before you shut the water off. So when they turned it back on, it was coming out brown and called back or told, just run the water outside for 10 or 15 minutes. I had to drain my water dinner. I had to change my filter and my refrigerator. I had to drain all the water out of my house. Now, I'm sure I'm going to pay for all that water that went down the curb because this water district did not have the courtesy to tell me they were going to shut my water off. I believe you're required to tell us when you're shutting it off under the California Code regulations. And I believe when water is contaminated or the pressure drops below a certain amount, you're required to issue a cautionary boil water notice until you know the water is safe. None of that happened. So your service is horrible. You get an F minus for the way you treat your rate pairs here. So I dropped my thing off and then we're sitting in. 
Thank you. <clears throat> okay. I can't hear you. Hi, my name is Karen Brown. Yes. I think you guys need a history lesson. My family ran a system with 26 homes with a treatment plant and holding tanks, a 5,000 5, gallon gravity fed tank to the homes. And I know how to take care of a public system. I had to answer to customers as you do. When SLV took over, we were promised safe and high quality water at an equitable price. 2009, the rate increased 30% for three years. They needed more, the probation, the probation tank was used as a poster for repair examples and a big list on the improvements. 2011, the good old boys, used my money and rebuilt the tanks on Nina, Rebecca Drive, and did some trickery real estate in order to move a lot line so they could put in the tanks. And this benefited three of the directors who lived up there. And one of them even made money on the sale of this property. And then the district paid thousands to defend him. And then they devised your master water plan, which you are still following to this day. And in the master water plan, what was devised was this campus, this campus idea. And they wanted to use the campus, I don't have it here, but <laughs> to consolidate all their equipment, all of their supplies into one place, which is great if you live in Boulder Creek, but having lived through all these disasters, you do that, all your forces like Pearl Harbor are in one place. You need them strategically distributed out and amongst all of us. So when we have major storms, major problems, trees down, highways closed, we can attack from all the different sides to repair the water and get our, your customers back online. 2014, another rate increase. You changed the district managers. The old one got a $95,000 severance package. The interim manager gets an unnecessary raise for $154,000 per year. And then there's $1.5 million set for the CIP project. There's a grand jury investigation. And you bought three fully loaded trucks for engineers. The probation tank was ordered to be started, and it was replaced five times bigger than it needed to be to service what? Scotts Valley, the master water plan. The director, gave, one director gave. Ma'am, your time's up. Okay. She can have my minute. Well, since I knew this was going to happen, I made copies for everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you for your remarks. Maybe the meeting's over after me. <laughs> okay, who's next? Any, any, any further comments that are not related to the rate increase? Do we have any more comments that are not related to the rate increase? And not on the agenda tonight. <laughs> Mr. Holloway. I'm uh, Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. I appreciate the fact that uh, all five of you are lined up the way you are. It makes it a lot easier to tell who's who. Um, I haven't seen this before. Usually you're wrapped around sides, and it's difficult to tell who's, who's staff and who's a board member. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Do we have any more comments that are not part of the rate increase and not on the agenda tonight? Okay. Well, I'd like, I'd like to oh, you have a public Thank you. comment. I usually don't attend these meetings, and I became very interested. When, uh, we've had so much disaster. I've lived in this town for a really long time, and they finally put the fire hydrants in in my area. But when I approached the guys, 
I said, what about the water pipes? And they said, no, that's for a future date. So I live Brookside, you put the all the new fire hydrants, which I'm thankful. It took the CZU fire I'm thankful to have my home. My question would be, what did you, more did you do besides fire hydrants? And it took over 50 years. There was only one little fire hydrant and five homes burnt down in my area since I've lived there permanently in 74, I moved there permanently. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that this flyer came to us all, I had um, some senior friends and we were gonna go to the meeting um, that was the sales, you know, for the, like bringing us up to what and why. And I've been conserving water for all this time. And I'm thankful to this Bob for writing your article because I that's what brought everything to my attention when you said we deserve more as ratepayers and that the accountability part is not listed. And so, like I said, when the guys are saying in the road you were supposed to have that paved, and all you did was pave where the new pipe is in, it's wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. the new fire hydrants. They're all up and down the road, but it took over 50 years. It's a long time. And it took a CZU fire. And I'm wondering if that was part of the regulation for the um, for the FEMA loans, or was that a part of the regulation from insurance companies to have to install the water hydrants? That, I don't know. Maybe I've missed... <laughs> several of the neighbors threw those things when I said did you get the flyer if you do not say no you are a yes vote they said what flyer so many people weren't even aware and so it's kind of like your intentions are good we all live in this valley we know we need things I'm for all that and when the uh, water was shut off quickly in my neighborhood when the pipes were being done without notice. I called immediately and everybody's always so nice at the water department. And when we were out of here at the CZU fire, the water guys were staying at the same property we were, which was my uh, son-in-law's sister's property. And they were camping there in their trailers and they would come back and give reports as to what was happening. For our, and my home was still no. intact. So thank you. Yes. And um, I'm still not for this because I don't feel that we've had enough time. We've been through too much disaster with the water. Thank you. Your time is up. <laughs> okay. Seeing no other commenters, we will move on to. <coughs> Okay, changes to the end. Okay, unfinished business, and the first item on unfinished business is the public hearing on the proposed rate increase. So we are now transitioning from just a regular board meeting to the rate hearing and we'll proceed with the rate hearing and not deal with other issues except the rate hearing until we finish this portion. Okay, Brian. Thank you, President. Can you make sure that you're keeping order in here? Yeah. Um, thank you. So this is a little bit of a, um, I say lengthy, but a moderately length uh, presentation. So I'd ask that everybody put their seats in the upright position, put their drink tray up and stow it, fasten your seat belts, and we'll get going. Okay. Item one. So we are going to have Heather kick us off. Heather is our acting finance director at the moment. And I don't know, Holly, are you able to put her up so she's actually speaking full? CTV will do that. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and then that'll be followed by a presentation by the consultant, Raph Tellus, and I will make some closing remarks. So thank you. Take it away, Heather. Thank you. Good evening, board president and fellow directors. I'm Heather Ipoletti, senior advisor with RGS serving as interim finance director. I'm starting the presentation with some details about the events that got the district to this point. It all started when the board approved a contract with RAF TELUS for a rate study that was approved April 6, 2023. Then like most other utility rate studies, the study objectives includes preparing a five-year financial plan, assessing current financial situation and ongoing revenue needs, performing a cost of service analysis consistent with legal requirements, and then proposing rate structures to meet rate setting objectives. Those objectives included rate stability. This helps the district to weather droughts and emergencies. Also to address the inequity in a single uniform rate, as well as to encourage water conservation. The process began with a rates 101 workshop on July 13th, and then various versions of the financial plan with scenarios that met goals concerning debt coverage, cash flow, and reserve levels were presented to the board on September 7th and 14th, at least one presentation to the budget and finance committee with the board adopting the financial plan on October 5th. From those financial plans, the rate structure alternatives were created and presented to the budget and finance committee on October 23rd, and then to the board on November 2nd, and then on November, excuse me, December 7th, when the board accepted the rate study and directed staff to proceed with the Prop 218 process. No less than eight public meetings were held prior to tonight. A little bit more about the financial plan. The plan adopted includes a modest level of capital expenditures over a five-year period. Modest level is $25 million worth. It includes replacing raw water pipelines destroyed in the CZU fire. It also includes the current five-year CIP approved by the board during budget adoption, plus additional projects related to storm damage. Total planned projects actually exceed that $25 million number. Alternative funding sources will need to be found to pay for those additional projects. No change to the level of staffing has been proposed or included in the financial plan. Of the 25 million in projects, 19 million will be, is proposed to be paid for with debt financing. Assumed in the financial plan is a 4.5% 20 year market loan. The district will seek a loan with the most advantageous terms available at the time. As the funds are needed, it's important to note any debt financing will be presented to the board with additional public input. It's also important to note a financial plan is an estimate. Similar to the district's budget, biennial budget, it adjusts with time. It's not something set in stone. So that concludes my part. From the financial plan, the rate structure, is formulated and the rates are then calculated. And that's where the district manager, Bruce and Raph Tellis will take the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather, appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Presentation. Bear with me just a moment. All right, 
There we go. Uh, thank you, uh, board, district staff, and members for having us back here today to discuss the water and wastewater rate setting process. Um, as a reminder, these are the steps that we have stepped through to get to this point today, and we are at that last step here, the public hearing. Um, the district strives to meet several service level goals um, to provide safe drinking water. Some of those goals include replacing undersized and leaking mains, improving system-wide reliability in times of emergency, increasing water storage, and fire and storm damage recovery. On the wastewater side, those include regulatory requirements that drive additional capital needs and an existing collection system that needs improvement before it can be connected to the county CSA number seven. So now we'll step into the water enterprise. Um, as a reminder, the, all the revenues that come into the water enterprise um, go towards the operations and improvement of the water system. Um, the largest of those costs are related to supply, treatment, distribution, and debt service related to capital renewal, replacement, and improvement projects. Um, as a reminder, this is the approved water financial plan projection. This um, uses a mix of revenue adjustments and debt issues to uh, keep the plan um, at or near reserve target levels while trying to um, keep revenue adjustments at 10% or lower. Um, so what the financial plan does is tells us how large of a, how large the pie needs to be, how much money um, is needed to operate the system and meet the levels of service goals. Um, what cost of service does is then says, how do we divide up that pie between the different customer classes? Um, so this is a method um, to recover costs from customers in proportion to their usage of the system. Um, so we allocate costs to customer classes based on how the customers use the water, um, for example, peak versus average flow. Um, the cost of service is described in the American Water Works Association <laughs> Manual M1, principles of rates, fees, and charges. And this methodology is used throughout the United States to set public and privately owned water. <laughs> and from this cost of service analysis, we can help develop the rates. And while developing the rates, we also keep, we're keeping in mind balancing the policy objectives related to revenue stability, conservation, and affordability. Um, so we created a separate line item for capital related costs to help increase the transparency um, in, in how your rates are being used. Um, for increased revenue stability, we increased fixed cost recovery from 37% to 45% um, to try to uh, counterbalance that with regards to affordability. We developed tiered rates for residential for the residential customer class, and we added a new charge for private fire service customers. Uh, we also keep in mind tier and peaking considerations when we were developing the rates. Um, the key factors that came out of the San Juan Capistrano decision is um, that, you know, tiered rates are allowed, but they have to be justified. Um, the city in that case to use multipliers to justify the tiered rates without an administrative record of the underlying rationale. Um, Raftalis was retained after that to redo the tier rates and those were not challenged. Um, other considerations are that peaking costs for um, operations, maintenance, and capital are related to treatment, reservoirs and storage, transmission, and distribution. The water system is used day to day to meet customer demand, um, but fire is, is emergency use only and the industry standard um, is to allocate costs on a customer usage and demand basis. So we use the detailed billing data to help um, define or to calculate the demand characteristics and to uh, determine customer, cl customer classes to use for the rate structure. So we have um, single family residential, which includes single family as well as um, homes with a single ADU. Um, commercial, which includes multi-residential mobile homes and homes with two or more ADUs, 
um, an industrial class, which includes schools and private mutuals and irrigation, which includes the parks. Um, so on this slide, we're graphically showing you those um, system demand characteristics by the different customer classes. And um, you can see that we've also broken out residential into the three proposed tiers because we look at each of those tiers as its own individual customer class to help determine these demand patterns. Um, so you can see sort of the overall seasonal variation um, as well as um, how the classes sort of classes and tiers peak um, throughout throughout this season. And the table in the bottom right. Uh, shows you those peaking factor calculations. So we look at the max month usage divided by the average demand, and that can you can see that uh, peaking factor there or demand characteristic for the customer class. You can see that residential tier one is relatively flat, has um, very little uh, peaking to it. Um, whereas, for example, the irrigation class has um, a lot of peaking. It's mostly used in the summer months. Um, so when we're looking at tier rate design derivation, the tiered rates, just like rates for all the uniform for the uniform customer classes, um, must be based on the cost to serve the water to serve customers in that tier. And as we said, we use the demand characteristics for the classes and for those tiers to determine that. Um, the tiers can also be broken down into different components. Um, we used base, extra capacity and conservation. So base is kind of the average amount of supply and delivery costs that are incurred. And those are the same for every customer class and tier. The extra capacity costs um, get allocated based on those demand characteristics that we were just discussing. And then there are also conservation costs that are um, identified by the district, um, but those um, are applied to every customer class and tier equally as well, because um, those conservation efforts are a benefit to the entire system. There's not um, a focus on one particular class or tier. And so you add those up together to get the total volumetric rate for each of the tiers. This next slide is showing an example of how the billing will work for um, single family customers with this new tiered structure. So currently, um, all, all usage is priced at the same amount. So if you say had seven units um, of water use in a month, all, of, all seven units of that water would be priced at $12.66. Um, in the proposed rate structure, using the proposed fiscal year 2024 rates, your, uh, that seven units of water would be split across two tiers. Your first four units would be priced at that tier one price of eight sixty nine, dollars and the next three units would be priced at the second tier price. So your seven units aren't all priced at tier two, the eleven seventy nine. dollars It steps through those tiers. So the first four would be priced at the tier one price, the remaining three at that tier two price. Um, in addition, the district has the fire recovery surcharge. There are no changes contemplated for that charge, and the $5 million threshold um, is still in place. It's anticipated that that would be met in early fiscal year 2027, and once it's met, that charge will be removed from your bill. Um, so this slide is showing um, the single-family bill impacts at different usage levels. And what you see, the dark colored bars are the bill um, under the current rate structure and the current rates at different levels. So, um, you know, you might have one bill, you might have a bill for one month that's at four, and maybe you have a, a summer bill that's at seven or so. So um, as your usage varies from month to month, you can kind of get an example see where that would fall. And then what the light, light blue bar is showing you is the five-year average bill. So we looked at what is the um, average bill over the five-year rate setting period that we're examining and what does that look like um, on average over, over that year compared to the current bill. Um, and this one is showing um, an example of the seasonal variation throughout the year. Um, so let me first orient you. The blue colored bars are showing you the portion of the bill that is um, recovered through the fixed charges. 
and the green is showing the volumetric portion of the bill. The light colored bar, so the light blue and the light green are under the current um, rates and the dark blue and dark green are under the proposed fiscal year 2024 rates. So you can see um, as this example moves through um, winter usage around four CCF up to summer usage of seven CCF, um, what the bill looks like under the current rates and under the proposed rates for fiscal year 2024 and what portion um, is, is coming from fixed versus volume. And then just the overall difference as you would move throughout the year with different um, amounts of water use throughout the year. And then this next slide is showing your neighborhood agency comparison for fiscal year 2024 rates. So these are the rates that are either um, on the books or being proposed for these entities for fiscal year 2024 and using a six unit per month bill on a five eighths inch meter. And um, you can see the comparison here that the district falls in sort of the middle segment of the comparison agencies. So now I'll move on to the wastewater enterprise. Um, as with the water, all um, revenue generated by the wastewater rates go towards the operations of the wastewater system. Um, you can see that the largest components of that are for um, contract professional services, salaries and benefits, and operating um, expenses of the wastewater system. Um, this shows the approved water financial plan projection. Um, it's taking into consideration that there was a no notice of violation of the wastewater discharge permit issued on April 1st, 2016. And it's a, uh, set to keep pace with the projected overall increase in operations and maintenance costs. Um, additional adjust, um, rationale for this adjustment to the wastewater rates for the Bear Creek Estates is to provide customers with a steady regular schedule of rate adjustments that align with the projected annual increases in expenses to have sufficient funds to cover annual expenses while building reserves to target levels by fiscal year 2026. And if reserves grow over time as projected, reserves over the target will be used to help defray costs required to bring the treatment plant into compliance if required by the state water board. And now I'd like to hand it back to Brian. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so I just wanted to make some final observations here. Um, and I think Heather pointed it out at the beginning in her discussion. Um, the rate study is a model. And I know one of the criticisms was we were gonna walk out the door and take out a $19 million loan as soon as this rate study is done. The rate study depends on that. It's a conservative estimate that that's what we would do, but it isn't necessarily how we're gonna act in reality. We're, we may only need 4 million of it at one time and then followed by maybe 5 million more, et cetera. But we have to assume something, but I think I know that one of the criticisms were, we're gonna go borrow this all at once and. The model assumes that the rates and the big rates are based on that action because we have to assume something for the model. And models hopefully are a good method of predicting reality. But that doesn't mean we're going to go out and do that. And I just want to point that out. We could be a little more measured in how we borrow that money. That's one of one of the points I wanted to make. The other one was um, you could turn to the next slide, Teresa. Thank you. Um, I know that initially we had presented first year increase. And I think that we probably did ourselves a disfavor when we did that. Um, because if you look at the red bars in this graph, it is an extreme difference that first year, someone that doesn't even tick over the meter, they've got a $20 increase on their bill where there's, whereas somebody that uses eight units um, in that month, 99 cents. So that bothered me as well. And that was pointed out to me. And it's, but as an analyst, I realize that's not all the data. 
And what happens is, is when you tinker with knobs on a rate study or any kind of rate structure, and we did, we shifted more costs over to the fixed rather than the variable cost. Um, that first year does get a little bit, it seems a little bit out of line. But when you take the whole five years and average it, now look at the blue bars, it's a much less of a, yeah. of a steep increase. When you look at it overall, $26 versus $16, not over 20 times difference. So that's one thing that I want to point out here is that it's not as extreme. And, and like I said, I think we did ourselves a disservice by only pointing out that first year increase. Um, next slide, Teresa. Thank you. Um, here's another chart here that I wanted to, to show. And this is looking at the percent of the bills that fall under one category. So in this particular graph, if you look there, zero, that's about, and you know, while I'm presenting, I really appreciate it. Let's keep your voices down. Thank you. So 7% um, of the people roughly are paying 7% of the revenue. You go on to the next one, you can see that they're more like eight, 9%. And I can read this off, nine, nearly 9%, but they're paying 7.6% of the increase. And if you go all the way along here, you see the light blue bars are the percent of customers that got billed in that billing unit for the billing unit. And in every single situation, until you get to about nine units of, of water, it's greater. That means there's more people paying less of percent of the total increase. And so what that shows is, is that really we're, one of the criticisms are that we're shifting this whole that that we are billing the lower the lower users are footing this bill, whereas that's not really the case. And what you can see is that crossover at nine units is that's when the tiered rates kick in. And now you look at the blue bars are higher. That means that there's more revenue paid by less of I hope hopefully that's that makes sense. And another way to look at this is if you have say there's 55% of the total, excuse me, 55% of the total revenue is paid by 75% of the people. So that first 75% of the customers, which is the lower users, all up to a point, they're paying only 55% of all the revenue. That means that there's 25% of the people that are paying the other 45. Okay. Um, and I believe that's my last slide there. So essentially that, that's what I wanted to point out is I did a lot of number crunching on this because I was really bothered by that whole statement that people that don't use a lot are footing this bill and my determination is no, they're not. The higher users are the ones that are paying. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll open up to questions now. Yes. So we'll now open this up to public comments. Yep. Oh, questions only. A oh, question from the board? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, that's what we've typically done. Yes. I don't know if you were segueing from the public. I think, I, I think some clarifying I questions might public. be in order. Huh? Yes, let's, let's do a couple of questions from the board. Right, there's clarifying sure. questions, but I think we're here. It's a hearing. We're here we're, to we're hear. We're here to hear them. <laughs> we're here to hear, that, hear them. Okay. Um, Normally, the board would ask any questions. No, no, that's what I said, if there's clarifying questions, but. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. If, you, if any of the board members have any questions regarding the presentation yeah. to clarify what was presented, those should be asked now. Yes, let's do that then. Bob, do you want to start? Um, yes. Um, our finance director used the word plan for the financial numbers that were put together. You used the word model. Plan to me means something different than model. But neither one of them are a budget. So what level of commitment is that, are those numbers? Is it a model? Is it a plan? Is it a budget? They're both the model. The model, the plan is based on the model and both are to develop the rates. And are those commitments that 
that had been made to the community. In what manner are you saying a commitment? A vote of the board. But, but specific to what? Specific to the, those numbers being the budget that we're going to follow. Uh, we're voting on a rate increase, not a budget. So the numbers, the plan that we put together then were not was not a budget. It was only a model. We can change that at any time. Is that basically what I'm hearing? We are, we have a plan and a model that supports the rate increase. A budget is a completely other topic. That's saying how you're getting, now you have the revenue coming in and now you're gonna say how you're spending it. And we're here talking about rates and increasing the rates. We're not talking about a budget. Next question has to do with reserves. It was unclear to me uh, how much of the reserves were free cash versus how much was being funded by borrowing. Do we have any numbers on those? Um, would one of the folks at RAF tell us be able to answer that? May I actually um, make a statement in regards to that? Sure. Thank you. The district is unable to borrow money and call it reserves. When we borrow money, it has to be used for <clears throat> capital projects. And how the reserves get built up by us borrowing money, we are using the debt proceeds to pay for our capital projects instead of going into reserves for those projects. So to say that we are borrowing money and it's going directly into reserves would not be accurate. I, I'm I'm very confused then, and I, I apologize for being confused. But maybe you can help me. Can, can we have the track together. Um, can, so when I look at the when I look at the Raftella's presentation, it talked about reserves. It looked like it was a very very large number, and I I don't know how you get to that large number without including the cash from the borrowing. Could you clarify that, please? The assumption is that we're spending that on capital projects, not, not just putting it into reserves. We yeah. cannot do that. And so, I, yeah, No, I understand. I just don't understand yeah. how on the, on the slide we can call it reserves, but here we're saying it's not reserves. I mean, if we could bring the slide up, maybe we could Please. clarify it. Teresa, are you able to bring up that slide? Uh, let me maybe address that. You know, so I think uh, this is for simplification. We are just showing the amount of cash that is going to be available to the district to finance its capital projects. We have not tried to show the debt funding separately, but included that in just the total amount of cash available to the district. Yes, it is. It is. Did, did that, that you're seeing on in in twenty five that is is uh, boosting up the reserve, but basically you can assume you know you know if you when you look at the this particular chart here maybe I should sign up let's see um, share screen okay you are you are sharing it oh you're talking about the so, so, you know, when you're looking at this 2025, actually, that's the year that we, we we borrowed supposedly money in the current year, and that helps up to build up this $22.3 million that you see. But in, in essence, if you were to see what your actual reserves are, it would be, you would have to subtract the amount that is actually used by um, the capital cost to come up with the amount that is, you know, that your actual reserve is. But for purpose of simplification, we have just shown that as combined. So that be, that is the total amount of cash that you have available now to be able to finance your capital costs and meet your reserve requirements as well. 
Well, how do we meet the reserve requirements if those aren't reserves? I, I'm very confused about So that. we don't meet the reserve requirements in those particular years. You know, I don't know what we are trying to establish over here. What I'm trying to establish is that the blue bar there with the dark line for reserves makes it look like, particularly in the FY 2025 year, that we have a balance alert and we're under our reserves. If, okay. It, okay. Right? So, so, the, so the, the graph is conflating two things that are very different, it looks like. And so I, I appreciate you uh, clarifying that, but it looks like the blue bars are not the actual reserves. Okay, so would you like to see our rates increase by 100% to bring up the reserves to the level that we require to meet the targets? Is that what you're suggesting? Um, I, that, you know, I would really appreciate it if as a consultant, you would not put words in my mouth or attempt to do so. I will make the statement about what my policy is. Is that understood? We we can drop that drop those reserves and show what the, it is net of the debt that you have. And I don't know what that would basically convey I, to you know. I, I think it is very important, sir, that we be crystal clear and transparent with our community about what our exact financial position is, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. Here, here. I'm not asking you to do anything other than that. What I am asking is that we not do a graph like this that, complete, that conflates two different cash balances into one line and makes it seem like we're okay on reserves except for that one year. Is that understood? I think you understood the yes. question. Great. Thank you. Understand your position. All right. Understands the question. Next, yes. next clarifying question. On the AWWM1, um, what I think I heard, but I wanted to make sure I, I got this crystal clear, is that those calculations do meet the requirements of Capistrano and that that has actually been tested in the court. I don't think that Capistrano addresses anything like a WWA. I mean, Capistrano was dealing with the, the failure to support the tiers. So has, and, and the next question is, has, has there been subsequent case law that establishes how to, what is a, a good tiered rate? No. We Capistrano don't have, holds. Capistrano is good law, yes. Okay. Yes, there hasn't been what we call reported cases to, to provide further clarification on tiered rates. There is one about to be decided though, I think. Yes, yeah. there, there, are, there are lots of things pending out there on 218. Yeah, but <laughs> There's there a lot of case law in this area. Okay, so um, my, then my understanding on the way we calculate costs to justify tiered rates is through a monthly peaking average, not around peak busy hour or actual uh, measurements that are taken around what those peak busy hour or peak busy four hour periods might be. It is basically a rough calculation based on total monthly usage. Is that correct? That's right. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on. I have no questions on the presentation. I do have some on the details on, and we, on other aspects that will follow. And we will have another opportunity. We'll have another opportunity. Yeah. We will have opportunity after we have the public comments for the board to discuss. Okay. Right. Thanks. Tammy? Thanks. I just wanted to clarify um, the issue of whether this is a budget, um, because while I think that, you know, we understand this, there may be some folks who are new to this process. So we set our budgets um, beginning with the fiscal year starting in July, right? So we'll be passing a budget um, that the staff will bring to us in uh, May uh, and June. We'll look at the budget. We can't actually begin to set a budget until we know what our rates are gonna be because our rates are gonna determine our revenues, right? So then we know how much money we'll have coming in and, and the staff can then put a budget together to propose how to use that money beginning with the next fiscal year that starts in July. If for some reason this um, process were not to go forward, if the rate were not to pass, we would have a different budget starting in July, which would be much smaller, obviously. Um, and the staff would have to figure out how to put that together for us, which is why this is not a budget setting process. This is just to look at the rates. So I would add one further comment to that, and that is that we set our budgets on a biannual basis. 
It's a rolling two years. Um, the revenue uh, rate study is based on a five-year estimate. And Raph Tellis made that very clear that it was an estimate, not a budget at that point. So, Gail, do you have any comments? Question. Well, I, just to, I, to say that when you have uh, the revenue, uh, the plan, the financial plan, that does embody some assumptions about how we divide our money between operating <laughs> expenses and capital expenses. And we will certainly be budgeting to the extent that we can very closely to that because the Raptelis in their modeling used a lot of information that came from the staff based on previous budgets and what we plan to do in the future. But we do not control everything. I mean, we can have another earthquake. We can have uh, another storm. We could have, <coughs> God forbid, another fire. And so... Our intentions are that we will follow that revenue plan and we'll spend uh, the money the way we've modeled and have established how much money we need to be able to do that to complete the capital plan that is given in the report. But we can't promise, cross our hearts, that that's what we're going to do because every year we have to deal with the circumstances that are there. And that's what the budget process is about. And that's where you as the public can come in and have your input in the budget process every year. So Bob wants us to promise, but it would be dishonest for me to say that although I will do the best I can um, on the budget and finance committee to match the plan, I, you know, I, I can't say that that's exactly what will happen because stuff, stuff happens here in the Valley. Okay, so at this point, we'll move on to public comments. And as before, three minute limit, please introduce yourself. And we would like you to give us your name and address, but that's not required. Vincent Rolf, Boulder Creek. Um, if you look at the flyer that the water district sent out to us, page three at the top of the page, uh, if you look at chart, uh, the chart it shows uh, in the first year of the rate increase, 8274 for a single family that uses two units of water. Uh, those, uh, that's uh, 4137 per unit, if you look at it that way. You also see that 282.22 for a single family who uses 16 units a month, that's 1764 per unit. You would think that if you use more water, it would cost more. Uh, that's quite a savings for someone who uses a lot of water. A primary function of a water district is water delivery. There are a lot of costs involved in water delivery, labor, infrastructure, repair, maintenance, equipment, fuel, electricity, building, all kinds of stuff. The SOP Water District has complicated billing by dividing up costs of water delivery into service charges, capital charges, volumetric charges. All these considered water delivery costs. My suggestion is simplify, just bill water. Instead of various service charges, raise the volumetric rate, set a base of three water units so that people who use no water pay a base amount for being hooked up to the system. The water should be just that, a water bill. I have been an SOB customer since 1979. It's my water district, but even I will be willing to sign on to a class action suit. The current rate structure and proposed rate structures are unfair to those who conserve water. I suggest the board withdraw the rate proposal. Thank you. My name is Christopher Rang. I'm a woman, and uh, my pet peeve with this rate increase is in the tiered system, it should be from one to four gallons in the first tier. You should turn over the, the, the meter before you get billed for any water that you get. During the drought years, I, I moved a two gallon uh, water mayo bucket into my shower and I, I, I use gray water to flush my toilet. I use less than 300 gallons a month. I'm a single guy living alone, but I can do that. And under this system, you're gonna be charging me for using as many as four units of water that I never use. In my old water bill, I got a volumetric charge once every three months. Under this system, I'll be paying every month for water that I don't use. Once again, you know, be concerned during the drought years. We build methods and techniques and practices to, to help you guys 
And uh, at this point, at this point, you're screwing us over because those drought years are going to come again. And uh, and some of us will be ready, but we have to pay through the nose for doing our best practices to conserve water. It's just plain unfair. Um, the only other thing I'm going to say is <clears throat> debt service is way too high on the, in this budget. There ought, to, there ought to be some way to knock that down. It's a huge chunk of your budget. Thank you for your consideration. And we all love you, Thank you, sir. We do. Hello, I'm uh, Bob Turner, live in Boulder Creek, and I just want to echo the comments of the previous uh, gentleman who spoke. That is, if you go to the slide that was presented tonight, single family bill impacts at different usage. Which, by the way, when you're presenting these slides, if you would use a pointer or something on your presentation, then people in the audience could follow you. Since we're not uh, as familiar with these details as you are. At any rate, if you look at that, it says that the current bill at two units is $70.33 with the five year average. This is the slide you presented tonight. Can you pull it up? Uh, I can't. You don't have command of your own file? <laughs> okay, so then it says the five year average bill is $91.50. That means over five years it'll average $91.56. Is that correct? This isn't a conversation. You can make your comments. Though. Thank My you. comment is, is that you made a very poor presentation and now you refuse to even comment about it. So what you're saying is that two units, we see a 30% increase. However, at four units, we see a 17% a, uh, a increase. At six units, you have something like a 14% increase. So yes, indeed, the people who use the least water will pay the biggest impact on their water bill. That's not fair. It doesn't encourage con conservation. If you're gonna have a, a rate increase, you know, do it like most metropolitan areas do. You have a tier one that's basic service, it has a certain rate. Tier two is people who conserve less, they pay a higher rate when their usage goes above tier one. Tier three, same thing. They pay a higher rate yet when their usage goes above tier two. So that's my comment. And I thought that your presentation was very rude in that you don't assist the people at this meeting to even follow your damn presentation. You sit there and you say, look at, you know, you can see from this point, from that point, from that point. You're not using a pointer. You're not showing them what the hell you're talking about. So it's like, a lot of it feels like smoke and mirrors. I'm sorry to say. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Masood Madani. The water is free, and they already charge it enough. If they can't figure out their budgets, they should hire somebody else to do the budgets. I have more units than anybody else in San, in, in San Lorenzo Valley. And I, is anybody works for a water company here? Anybody? That way they can see how much I pay every month to the water company. <clears throat> I pay over fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month. I'm sorry, a year to the water company. And if this increase is gonna happen, I can't afford it. Because my tenants and they, they never pay for the water bill, and I pay for everything. I can't tell them not to use it or do whatever. If they give me a meter for every unit I have, I don't care what prices you're gonna charge. I've got 60, 70 units in San Lorenzo Valley and I rent. And I pay for everybody's water. And if it's going to go up 48%, you're talking about I'm going to pay another thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year more. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark C. I'm from Town Holman. I'm outraged at this proposal that we have here before us. 
It's inequitable. The people know it. You are punishing the conservation users in this community. My recommendation is you go to take this with great height. It's inequitable. Go back to the drawing board and come back with something that is more reasonable. You charge for water and reduce the basic connection fee. This is outrageous. You're going to have, you're going to spawn lawsuits after lawsuits. And yes, the Capistrano case is being challenged in San Diego on the chair structure. You open a can of worms here and you don't even know it. My recommendation is to withdraw this proposal and go back to the drawing board. This is inequitable. The people know it. It's unfair. Those that are conserving water are being charged and punished for conserving water. It doesn't make sense. 54% of, of the increase is paid by those users that are zero to four per units per month. The people are using, for example, anyone that's in gardening that has is using two, five to eight units is paying 5% increases. Do you consider that equitable? No. Those that are uh, using tier three, nine units plus are using 41% of the rate increase. I mean, it's not fair. Please withdraw this proposal. And that's what I have. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andy Benker, and I live in Bed Lomond. Um, I'm here to voice support for the plan. Um, I think uh, we have a lot of costs that need to be addressed in the district, and rates from uh, previous boards have been kept artificially low. Um, I don't want to pay higher rates. Nobody wants to pay higher rates. Um, but unfortunately, that's the world that we live in. Um, and a lot was put into this plan, and I think to uh, not pass this at this point will end up costing the district and ratepayers more. So I support the plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm a John Patrick O'Reilly, <clears throat> living in Ben Lomond for about 25 years, and I am halfway agreeing with him. I think everybody is agreeing with him, realizing that things cost more in this day and age. Um, and we're going to be getting a rate increase at some point. But my one of my biggest objections was with the initial flyer that we all received. And when it states, uh, the specific water rate increase for each customer will depend on their meter size, the amount of water used in their category. Category. Typical residential water customers will not see their monthly bill increase by a few dollars in, in 2024. <laughs> a few dollars. Then it goes on. <laughs> residential water customers who use the exceptionally large water quantities of water would experience larger annual increases, possibly 20% uh, or more. You know, you have with this, this, you've insulted every uh, residential water payer, making it sound, oh, don't crack the numbers, don't, oh, you know, whatever you do, don't look at the numbers. Looking at these single water, single family water bill impacts, it will in four years go up roughly, I figure, 87%, nearing that 20%. It's just not the 20% of water uh, uses, uh, larger annual water increase. Wait, the last sentence residential water customers who use exceptionally large water quantities. Uh, quantities of water will experience larger annual increases. No, it's not the opposite. You've insulted us in a way by that statement. And I think that's why everybody is teed off a little bit more that they've cracked the numbers and just seen that it just is not equitable. I love that word used or, or prior. It's not equitable down the line. Anyway, 
That's my two cents. Thank you, sir. John Eager, 904 Lockwood Lane, Scotts Valley. But first of all, listen, I know you're all elected. You're not making any money good as for good community. I applaud you for doing that. Sorry I have to come in here and rail on you, but uh, I didn't cause that. Uh, I, I would say he did, he's your manager. This, this is my wallet. This is my, what I got left at the end of the month, right? I get to use this. Now, for some reason, your manager thinks this is his wallet because he wants me to open it up and let him take what's in here out and figure out how I pay the rest of my bills afterwards. Now, if you could go and get Social Security to increase my Social Security check by 45%, I'd be happy to give you your 45% of that. But that's not going to happen. I got to live within my wallet, within my means. And that's my biggest concern. What you're doing here is it's like the rate payers are just an open wallet or an open checkbook. Cash cow. And so uh, I'm opposed to what you're doing because there's not enough transparency to really know where the money's going. When I looked at those slides and I saw somewhere in the neighborhood, 25% of that, that pie chart was debt management. I, I don't run my personal uh, finances at 25 percent owing debt on it and that's unacceptable to me so my suggestion is be a little more transparent i came from scotts valley i bet there's not too many other people here from there okay so out here in the audience so um it's not always convenient for us to come here, just like people in Boulder Creek say, it's a lot farther to Santa Cruz than it is from Santa Cruz to Boulder Creek, right? You don't want to go down there, but we don't want to come up here either. So uh, <laughs> make it more convenient for people to understand what you're doing, but how do you manage your money? Remember, it's coming out of this wallet and that wallet and that wallet and that wallet there. And at some point, what if the guy who pays fifty thousand dollars? He's not gonna be able to pay it anymore. Um, so, so yeah, they're gonna have to do something else. The last thing I'm gonna tell you, my last forty-two seconds, is I take great offense to that consultant there. For him to talk to a board member the way he spoke to the board member, he should be fired. Agreed. Yeah. 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 We're paying you to pay him, and yeah. he talks to a board member like that. He should be fired and go find somebody else that's more respectable to you and the community. Yep. Yeah. I've been here for a couple of days. My name is Gemma Renee Locatelli. Okay, pull the microphone closer to you or speak up. I'm only coming to listen. Thank you. But when the uh, consultant was rude, I couldn't help but kind of say something. I came because my landlord pays my water bill, and if the water is increased, I'm pretty sure my rent is going to increase. <clears throat> With that said, I was going to ask back and forth questions like the Big Basin Water people did, but I guess that's not how it goes here. So uh, are there any printouts that show itemize the fund allocation? Do you plan to do the work in-house, or are you planning to hire outside? Are you, uh, are any raises for the people that aren't here, that are on the uh, Zoom call or whatever, is money going to them? Uh, it's my understanding that the projection is 25 million, but only 5 million is going to be on the backs of this little tiny community, which is actually a really wonderful community. And I kind of resent somebody saying that we don't understand how this process works. Most of the community are like myself. I worked in high tech. I was a code writer, I'm C++ certified, I have multiple other degrees, so to say that I don't understand basic formulation isn't true, but the math isn't mathing for me, and I'll just say that. Um, how much of the money is, is leaving the SLB? Again, to the people that are just on the Zoom conference, uh, how much money is going to them, along with raises to anybody else? And I appreciate you guys all being here. You guys all seem like very sweet people, and every time I've interacted with anybody at the SLB Water District, you've always been nice. Um, are you buying any new trucks or tractors and equipment to help our community, or any trucks or tractors to help any other communities? Yeah. The, which I don't mind. 
I'm going to just ask some questions. Um, I already asked that question. And then, um, are there any panelists on board here or not on board? And uh, yeah, I think I asked everything. I thought I was going to get answered for that, but that's okay. Thank you so much for being here. And again, I'm Gemma Renee Locatelli, and I'm not giving my address. <laughs> <laughs> My name is George Galt. I'm a 41 year president of Boulder Creek. I love it here. Um, I was going to speak as a private citizen, but actually, I'm called to do something else. I'm an elected official just like you guys are, uh, like, or you guys and women are, excuse me. Um, I'm, the, I'm the board of directors of Boulder Creek Recreation and Parks District. And um, so I'm going to talk from the point of view of a board member of Boulder Creek Rock and Parks District, not for the board. I'm not speaking for them. I'm speaking for myself. But So um, I'm pretty passionate about parks and recreation. Um, I'm pretty passionate about the water I drink as well. And I appreciate your work um, to provide safe and clean and um and water for, for all of us. And the fact that it's compared to pg and &E, is quite dependable. You know, <laughs> we, can, we can actually get water from <laughs> most sure. of the time. Not the case with the electricity of my house. So, um, uh, the, the process, the, the, what, the, a rec what our recreation and parks district provides is a, a, a way to build community through facilities and activities that we all can do together. And whether or not you participate in those activities, your community is stronger for their being there. There are a lot of studies that show that the more um, places that people have to gather in a um, in a, a, a friendly setting like a park or a coffee house for that matter, um, the more resilient that community is and the better they're able to respond to, to, to difficulties. So if Boulder Creek, if the San Lorenzo Valley Water District makes it possible to live in Boulder Creek, the Boulder Creek Recreation and Parks District makes it meaningful, helps to make it meaningful. So, um, we're going to be paying considerably more for water. Uh, uh, we spent about sixty-nine thousand dollars this year, this past year, on uh, on water. Um, in twenty twenty-eight, um, we've done the computation. It will be one hundred and four thousand. So that's a fifty percent increase. So uh, that is a significant impact and will cut into our ability to be able to serve our community. So I would, because it's we don't have any power to stop this, but the five of you do. So I think if I urge you to take that power and to hold off on doing this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Becky Fitzgerald and I live in Ben Um I have several concerns about this proposed rate increase. Uh, one of which is there have been, as far as I can tell, at least five, some of them multi-year rate increases for this water district since 2002. And it seems that we get a year off here or there, and then the board goes and does another rate study, and we have to pay more for our water. And uh, when people talk about, well, we, we want to make sure we have a stable financial base so that if, if problems occur, we can cover them. Well, we had uh, we went from having a bi-monthly bill to having a monthly bill that was supposed to help stabilize the monies coming in. We had this surcharge in 2021 for the CZU fire uh, issues. And I'm hearing now that it's not going to end until 2027. I thought it was a five-year thing, which would have made it 2026. I'm a little wondering about that. Um, I'm not even saying we don't have to pay more money. I'm, I'm just not sure that this is the way to do it. 
there's, there's several problems with it. I can't even tell, I'm in a different situation than most people because I've got three houses on my property. We're all on one water meter. Uh, it's all family, so it's not really a commercial enterprise. I don't know if we're going to go from the tier one, which is what we are now, to something else because we will then be a higher water usage, even though my last bill was for 11 units of water and that was for three, three houses, so less than four units of water a house. Um, my surcharge, or what do you call it, when you, your utility charge, when your basic utility charge is just to be hooked up to the system will go from 50 some odd dollars a month to almost 100 by the year 50th. And it seems like we're paying for our meters twice. You know, we're paying, if you have a meter and it's an inch, which is what ours is, then this is what your monthly cost is. And then there's this other cost that has to do with your meter size. And then we get to the water, which your water rates are gonna go down for the actual thing we're buying. It'll go up, the in five years it won't be as high as it is now for me for the just the water. So I have a lot of concerns about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, for the second time, please. No, no, no. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You can have more than it. Sorry, oh, no, okay. Okay. One, one, one time per person, please. Uh, I'm our own Mark Russell, I'm a 50 year resident of Boulder Creek. I'm really concerned about the fixed charges in this. Uh, the five use meter, according to page 20 of the report, says that it will go up 58% the first year. If you carry that up to the fifth year, it's 112%. Um, I've been to multiple meetings like this over the years. I have always promised, always promised that if you just approve this, multi percent rate increase that everything will be stabilized and we'll take care of all of our uh, um, deferred maintenance problems and everything will be fine. Uh, I have a bill here of mine from uh, 2012 and it's for uh, $87.45 for two months. And then I have one uh, from 11 years later that's $133.62 cents for one month. So that's a 309% increase over uh, 11 years. And that same time, according to the federal government, the consumer price index got up 33.7%. So basically my water bill has gone up 10 times the inflation rate in that length of time. And I, I just want to know when this is going to end and we finally stable, everything's stable and, and we're going to be somewhere near the actual cost of living for the rest of the country. It just seems like because we can't shop for water on Amazon somewhere else, you're taking advantage of it. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you. My name is Jeffrey Downs. I come from Felton. And um, I'm going to go backwards on my list here. And if I don't get to the reason I actually wanted to talk tonight, I run out of time. But um, as I heard things being presented today, one of the first things I heard is something about budget matching income. And it seems like you got the horse in front of the cart, or right, the cart in front of the horse. Now. You budget out what you need, and then you try to get the revenue to match it. But the other way around, you say, oh, well, hey, look, we got all this money. Well, let's spend it because we got it. That seems to be the back end of how it should be. The, some of these pre presentations dealt with this 2024, but you carry that out, these rates continue up. And as the gentleman in front of us just said, uh, just for the, the average user, you go from $35 to $75 with just your fixed fees. That's 112% increase over a, a four, four years. Um, so something seems wrong there. You can't be, having that much expense that you, you're, you're not doing your budgeting right. You're spending money on consultants or whatever, which should be going back into the infrastructure. Um, so, you, you know, and there was a lot of talk about the rates, but these fixed charges are going to kill people who are just trying to conserve the, you know, the rates are, are one thing, but the, the, these fixed charges are outrageous. Uh, I have a one-inch meter, and not because I use that much water, 
we'll get into that if I have time, but I'm going to be like paying $115 just to be connected to one of this without a drop point of use. That's, that's, a, that's not right. Um, so the fire connection, I noticed it was talked about, that was for, uh, maybe I will get to what I want to talk about, the fun, that you're going to be charging a fire connection. Great. Okay. Because the reason I have a one inch meter is because I had it for the sprinkler system inside my house. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't use that water. I don't need a one inch meter. I use, same as most of the residents here, I can use, I probably use a half inch meter if I had to. But I'm being hit with all these surcharges because I've got a fire protection system in my house. It's like the fire hydrant down the road. It's not using any water. Once you pay to put it there, you, you're done. There's no cost to you to the district at all. It just sits there. And that's what mine is doing. But I'm going to it. And, um, and it's not just a little bit. I'm getting, uh, if you follow this out, I'll be ending up paying 53% 50, more for a connection that I'm not using. So uh, I think you ought to re rethink about how you assign meter sizes versus I'm a residential user. And if you look at my how much I use, you'll find out that I'm not using one inch water. Uh, one inch is not necessary for water I use. Thank you. Hello, I'm an SLP water district user in Boulder Creek. And what we have to say is really quite simple. I don't understand asking for money without a budget. My proposal is to put together a budget and work with your community, which will help to develop trust, come up with a budget, and then let's put a plan together for, a sale, for an increase. Clearly, one is needed. But let's stop with the cart before the horse. Hi, Deborah Lowen from Long Pico Canyon. For once, I didn't really re prepare for anything here because I've been talking to you all along since what, Gail, April when this started? You and I exchanged emails. I was making a very big point then that, like no other rate increase proposal before, we should include the demographics of this area. We have 20% of our customers are retired. We have a larger, which is bigger than the rest of the county. We have the most number of veterans here. We have a great number of low income and middle income people here, all available on the statistics, which I sent, which you said you were going to consider, which, which I don't see in this report at all. In fact, what I see is ignoring the makeup of our community. I think a lot of these consultants come in and they look at the median household income and say, well, they can afford to pay this 58% increase. We cannot. Um, I want to just go back in time a little bit. Where I started out on this, um, I went back and looked at like the November presentation from Ralph Tellis. And I discovered that there were quite a lot of different proposals available to you. I think there were six plus within the six, there were just breakouts. And they all did different things, but Ralph Tellis was very careful to tell you that all of these proposals ended up giving you the same amount of money. Not all the proposals are as harsh as this one on the low income users, and yet you chose that. So this is on you, this is your legacy. This is probably gonna pass, but it is on the, the, the four board members who are going to approve this because Mr. Foles has already said he doesn't like this either. Um, I started investigating it and looking at the um, Proposition 218 thing that came out and on your website where it says the average user is going to see about a 2% increase. Average and sometimes called typical. But in the Raptelis report in November, it said that the median house, the median use is four units. So I was really curious why you were using a bigger number. And in fact, I did a uh, public records request, took a little while, got the information. There's double the amount of people using three units that are using six. Three is the most 
the highest category. The next highest category are people who use two units. That's me. <laughs> I am getting a 20% rate increase, and yet all your literature is telling me I'm getting a 2% rate increase if I'm typical. I am more typical than a six unit user. On one of the uh, power outages, I sat down. Yeah, my, we've run through your three minutes, please. I'm very much opposed to this. I think this needs to be withdrawn. I think it should be withdrawn from the beginning. Thank you. One more comment. Ralph Thomas did the, the rate increase for coastline water district. Um, they kept the base charge very low and charged for water. That was recently done. So any kind of word that you're following the Raptella's recommendation, you have to raise the base rates is completely false. <laughs> I'm Brian. I live in Ben Lomond, homeowner. I, um, I'm actually in favor of increases, but not this one. Uh, I, I recognize that there's a need to extend on um, certain items. But what's not really clear to me, and as a person who has a history of working for not for profits, or at least in the ones I've worked with, I was very transparent. What exactly are the projects that are needed to be spent on? What are the goals on that? And then at the end of five years, isn't there an end to some of these? I obviously <laughs> find like that. There's some end to this. Yeah. And I would be in favor of putting a you know, grandfathering clause on it or another revote at the end of any increase that is given so that there is a more of an accountability. And more transparency. Those are the two things I'm looking for to be able to say yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Don. Um, born and raised here. I actually work for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, I work on pipes. I fix all leaks. And it sucks. Thank you. It sucks. Thank you. It sucks. Yeah. It really sucks. And I am opposed to the rate increase too, but at the same at the same time, at the same time, I'm the one that sees what's underground. Nobody sees what's underground, and the age of infrastructure is ridiculous. It kind of needs to happen. So, and like somebody else quoted, the longer that we don't do this, the worse it's going to get, and the more expensive it's going to get. We're not debating that. I'm just saying, you know, as a ratepayer, I, you know, I'm just. Yeah. First hands on, you know, and yeah, I'm I feel bad for the people that had to deal with some of the you know bad maybe contractors that were hired. And yeah, no, I see you guys all the time. And I don't want to see you guys, I love you guys, but so I tell way too much, and that was you know, it's infrastructure that needs to be done, but you know, a lot of people get screwed over. And I feel too. I gotta deal with it. I gotta pay the rates. I gotta pay more. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. The district is still in stage one of a drought. Yeah, I lost the person. Um, you're more uh, considered the uh, okay. CTV. Somebody needs to mute. Yes. Uh, your board uh, considered this the stat status of uh, the drought emergency some months ago, and you decided to remain in, or I guess you decided to be in uh, stage one of a drought emergency. And the reason for that, as I recall, is that uh, since the fire, our um, water intake capacity off of Ben Loman Mountain is only about 40% of what it used to be. Um, there's a project to replace the Peabine pipeline, which will bring that to about 60% of what it used to be. Um, so that's a good reason uh, to consider to, to, to uh, CTV. 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 You CTV, you're talking. Uh, it's a good reason to continue uh, to take measures to get people to reduce consumption. 
to, to minimize consumption. And yet, uh, most of the customer classes here are actually going to be paying less per unit of water under this plan than they are today. People have been paying twelve sixty six a unit for you know, every customer class for over a year, and they're used to it. So I think it's it's kind of crazy to be reducing the volume price of water at all. Um, now, I know some people would just like to see this not even be implemented at all, but I can't help looking for a middle way uh, that's a little bit like this and a little bit like what you already have. So since um, the district has already gone through a Prop 218 process that authorizes 1266 per unit, I don't think you should reduce any of these prices below that. Um, and the that'll bring in more money so that you can reduce the basic rate. So I think what you should really do is keep 1266 as an absolute minimum and then knock about one third off of all the basic rates. Um, when I was looking at some of these graphs uh, about the peak usage, it looks like July and August are the peak months. And what occurred to me right away is that uh, the school schools are pretty deserted in July and August. And uh, so maybe they're not contributing as much as Scraptellus says to the peak usage. Uh, the names commercial, industrial, uh, they don't really apply to schools as far as I can see. So I think it's arbitrary to put schools in a category where they're going to have to pay more uh, more for water than Joe's Bar or Ernie's Auto. Uh, I think the schools should get the best rate that the district can offer. Uh, so I think there's um, there's changes that you want to make to this and not do it as, as a shown. Thank you. One person online. Okay, we have That's one right. question. Are these two on these these PowerPoints? Are they online? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they heard everything you said. He was asking if the PowerPoint presentation that the consultant oh, gave tonight yes. is online, and it is. It's on our yes. website. Are the consultants looking to work on this right here? I don't know whether they're still on right now, the consultants. I assume yes, that they are. are. Yeah. Okay, so I'm told that we have one person online, but I don't see it. So um, I see actually. Nancy. Yeah, yeah. Two. Nancy Lentz. And the Lena Okay. Can you hear me? So let's do Nancy. I'm Nancy, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yes. I wanted to comment on two things. Uh, number one, I wanted to say that I agree uh, that you were presented with a number of options for how to how to do these rate increases. And I'm I'm perplexed as to why this is the one you chose. There, there are others I think you could consider or at least maybe even make uh, a, a, a hyperbole of, you know, a couple of them. But I wanted to particularly address the, um, the, the page that showed how we would be somewhere in the middle of water rates. And I find that to be really perplexing. So we would be about 75% more per month than the average Santa Cruz water user. We would be about 25% more paying more in this area than we would the average Scotts Valley Water District user. And we would be getting very close to the Monterey district, which is literally the highest price in our nation for water. And it's hard for me to imagine that the SLV area can afford to be up there with the highest price in the nation for water. So I hope that you will not vote this in tonight. Take some time to consider some other ways you could go about collecting money and rate increases. I think we can all agree, we understand we have to have better systems and help our neighbors out who are still struggling after the fire and other areas. But to, to, to adopt this plan just doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not fair, it's not equitable. And I just wanted to say that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, would you mind if we do one more? Uh... Online. That's not what you normally do, but you go right ahead and do what you want to do. But there's only one person. Uh, Elena? 
Can we have Alina? Yep. Hi, Alina Lang, Boulder Creek. I just start out by saying thank you so much, Board, for giving your time and sitting through all of this. Like, we really do appreciate you. And the only thing I have to say is that I really do agree uh, with the parks and schools comment. That is my, my biggest worry with these rate increases. You know, I've said it last time when we had the, the meetings about this, but the school, they can't charge me more for sending my kid there. You know, the, those costs have to come from somewhere and they are, the, the schools are the largest water users in the area. Um, so they are going to be footing a big part of this bill. And, you know, they've already seen that they had a reading funding cut because the contractor on 236 uh, was starting work before 9 a.m. and they were holding traffic for over 20 minutes and people were trying to get to school. And if they're late to school, they lose reading funding. So they've already been impacted that way by the water district. That happened for months on end. Now they're going to get hit with a higher water bill. And so um, uh, like they're getting hurt hard. And then it's, when you go to parks and you think about parks, it's not just like, oh, it's it's one one rate increase for the parks. It's every single one of their locations. So Junction Park, you know, Garraham, um, their offices, downtown, like all of those are different, build differently. And so they have a fire charge, a fire charge on each one of those accounts. And now their base is going to go up on each one of those accounts. Um, and, you know, these are things that are critical to our community. And, you know, if that funding also has to come from somewhere else to be able to pay for these water bill increases. And so overall, I just I really wish that that would have been addressed that came up in the, you know, the meetings as we were before the Prop 218 process. And I didn't really hear any solutions on on how to help our schools and parks and help our community thrive uh, where people come together. Uh, anyways, but thank you so much uh, for listening to these comments and all the work that's been done on this. Lo, if you'd like to step on, thanks. First of all, I'd like to say I resent the fact that you didn't ask if there was any more people in the public that wanted to talk. I already stood up and was approaching the podium when you acknowledged people on Zoom call. I'm sorry, I just didn't. I just didn't see you. I had a scripted speech to give tonight, but I'm going to bear off of that because listening to all the input tonight made the problem for me crystal clear. And the problem is not this rate increase. The problem is everybody here believes our rates are going to continue to go up forever, and we have to break that vicious cycle. Right on. So towards that, I have two recommendations. One on infrastructure. Looking at page 59 on the rate study final draft, there's over 50 projects listed as projects that the district is going to be doing in the next five years, totaling over $75 million. What I see is a lot of projects dedicated towards delayed maintenance and fixing aging equipment. What I don't see is a, a plan that addresses a comprehensive, integrated, state-of-the-art, I can read my own writing, a plan that comes out of a strategic plan that addresses the future of the district. I think we're remiss by not having a strategic plan. I think that's something that is important to developing a really good plan for the future. So I would recommend that we wait until we have a strategic plan and know what the true costs are before we proceed. Because I think if we do that, the costs will probably go up from what you're suggesting. But ultimately, they might go down. And that's my goal. Second one is quality. Well, first of all, to give some examples of the infrastructure, because I hate to throw a problem out without giving some solutions. I've looked at six other districts in the state that are similar to us. The number of tanks they have on average is less than 10. We have 50. The average size of those tanks is 2 million gallons. The average size of our tanks is somewhere between 250 and 300,000 gallons. So we're nowhere near the norm. And I've had a lot of stock and best practices. Mm -hmm. So either they're doing something wrong or we're doing something wrong. And I think what it comes down to is that we are a district made up of 80 years of consolidating smaller districts into us. And all we've done is make it work. 
and not think about the ultimate goal of a streamlined strategic plan that's effective and reduces costs. The other part is pipes. The pipe connections vary widely all over the district. And that's because, again, of all the districts that we've assimilated without doing anything more than connecting the pipes to the water supply. What we need is an is integrate. We're, we're running out of time. Thank you. One quick comment. I think we need a quality professional in the organization, even though it's going to cost money. Okay. I'm Dean Acklin. I'm a 25 year Ben Lomond resident. And I, like everyone else in this room, doesn't like high rates for anything, whether it's PGE or water. And no one likes to see the rates go up. Can I see a, a show of hands from everyone in this room? Who wants to be a, a, ben, a, a big basin water customer right now? Can I show a show of hands? Who wants to be a big basin water customer? Can you point this? My point is, if we don't invest in the projects that need fixed, that are aging in this in the San Lorenzo Valley Water Company, we will be like big basin water. And that water is more important to me every single day, getting clean, healthy water to me every single day, knowing I'm going to get it long term and not be like my friends and family that are in big basin water system that don't have water and it affected their water, uh, their property prices. So we could be like big basin water or not. Thank you. Thank you. So we have we have um, Charlene online. Can we activate Charlene? She's muted. Are you muted, Charlene? Perhaps you can speak. She can speak now. Okay, Charlene, you can. Can you speak? We don't hear you. Scott, do you see anything? I see she's got her hand up. Yeah. I see she has her hand up, but she isn't responding. So, is she, is she, does she is hear there you? another speaker that we can go to while she sorts out her technical okay. issues? That's it. That's it. Well, that's it. Go on. Did you? Did you get me? No, oh, yes. no. Try again. Oh, okay. I figured it out. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate all the work that everybody's done, and I appreciate that we have a public agency that we can address and we elect you. And if this was PG&E, it would have just gone through without any kind of a public hearing. So I'm glad for the process. However, one thing I would like to see happen is I don't know if if you, I don't think you should go back to the drawing board. I think you've got a concept. But I think what I'm hearing from the audience, if they are representative of the community, and I don't know if that's true or not, is they have some good ideas of, you know, I, I thought people would just say, I don't want any of this, but a lot of it just came about from having to pay for something that you're not using. And if you, before you put everything into effect, Maybe if you could kind of look at how that could be done a little better or if it can be done a little better and show people that, I think you'd have more of a buy-in in some of the people who are just not happy and they've stated what their reasons are. So, you know, I think in like in 2013, something like that happened and, you know, they made a couple tweaks and everybody went away knowing they didn't get everything they wanted. but things were maybe uh, maybe people's concerns were addressed a little bit more. So I'm not sure what's going to happen once this conversation goes back to the board tonight, but I'm wondering if there's something you could do to kind of meet some of those, some of those needs, because I don't get that part either. And um, that's, you know, that's all I have to say other than, you know, for a few bucks a month, I turn on my tap and I've got clean water and there's people everywhere who don't. So, you know, we appreciate you and we appreciate the workers 
I don't want to see salaries cut. I just I want to see infrastructure, and I know we need the money for that. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else online? No. Okay. Is there anyone else here that wishes to speak? I just would like to know when the final tally is going to be totaled out and posted. Uh, right after this. Okay, so uh, we're going to close public comment at this point. And anyone that has a ballot with them uh, or wishes to fill out a ballot, now is the time to do it. We'll be closing the ballot box. After you have board discussion. Oh, yes, we do have to have board discussion. Yeah, the ballots are still being taken until you end the hearing. Okay, until you do have to have board county. discussion. So we'll move to board discussion. <clears throat> Okay, so this is where the board can respond to comments from the public if we choose. Um, so I'm going to start at the other end this time. Gail, do you have any comments that you yes, wish to make? Yes, um, I can't back here. Uh, Brian? Could you pass me the mic, please, so that I can put that in Gail's hands? So, thank you. I mean, we could we could do it that way. Um, We're having a little bit of a, a heartburn here over procedure. So maybe right. We yeah. Passed. Let's have a point of order discussion about how we want to. Okay. Yeah. The, the hearing. You're right, Brian. The hearing. So public hearing. Once we've had public comment, comment we need to count the ballots. Yeah. And, and then we close. That was. And then we, we close started. the hearing. That's and then we close the hearing, and then you'll have some words, and then you go to discussion. Right. Yeah. So what I would suggest, um, President, yes. <laughs> is that um, we right. uh, take a, a recess so that that not a recess. Happen. It has to happen during. Yeah, it can't lunch. be recessed. The hearing has to continue and yes. be open while you count the ballots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I know, so are you saying that you would like the board to make comments now? No, no, no. 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 I, I was mistaken. <laughs> what we need to do is we need to finish the hearing and then we go back to the agenda for the board to take action one way or no action, whatever they want to do. But we need to finish the hearing before we do that. Okay. So and in order to finish the hearing, you have to count the ballots. Yes. Yeah. So if anyone has any ballots, yeah. anyone else watch the vote. The box is there. Go yeah, now is the, now time, is the time to twice. submit your ballot. <laughs> so then we're just we're close the ballot box here in just a minute or two. Okay. Seeing none. Okay. Ballot box is closed. Thank you. Right. And then now we have to count the ballots. Right. Which needs to be done in front of the public. Yes. Yeah. So we're just going to sit here for a few minutes while that happens, and then we'll resume our discussion once that's We haven't count on everything up to now, and then we're going to count the ones that are here. Right. You actually just kind of sit here and wait. Yes. Okay. That's kind of what you do. Or use the facilities. Or well. use the facilities, get some water, stretch your legs. Sometimes we have got other agenda that. items, but. So, Bob, do you know the name of the San Diego case? But it's supposed to be decided like in the play, and that is that they're going to legislate and declare that cost can include social uh, goods like conservation, climate uh, change, other things like that. That that will now be part of the cost consideration. So when each time I stress conservation from the memo, I can put which effectively, <laughs> which effectively <laughs> you've got Prop 2 right here. Yeah. It almost doesn't yeah. define anything. Yeah. But that's what's in front of them right now. Yeah. I have this one. I'm for a lot of So, discuss what the cap is. That's the one you're talking about. I think. 
explain to you what the um, custody, what is it called? The, the chain of custody. The chain of custody is for the ballots. So in case you didn't know how they got to the district, uh, they came either by email, U.S. mail, or by drop-off. And those, um, as soon as they came to the district, they were delivered to me, where I stamped them on the date that they were received and put them in a fireproof cabinet where they stayed locked up until I put them in this box and sealed it up and brought it here tonight. Um, so let me, uh, the ballots that I received here this evening totaled 47 for a total of 1,376 protest vote, votes. I received 24 wastewater protest votes. So that's that. Thank you. That includes the email? Everything. Okay. That includes 1, everything that was sent to me. 1,376. 1,376. And Holly, do you know what the total would be to reach the 51? Um, it was approximately 3,951. Does that include the residents that houses burned up? Did you hear that those people? And in, in Street, the houses that burned, are they still This is out? This is um, for oh, connections precious. that we have. Yeah, but the, in the approximately 7,900. 911 houses that got burned? 911, no, there were 120. Yeah, in, our oh, yeah, that's in, our in our district. In our district. Yeah. Oh, in your district. In district. Okay. Well, in most Bonnie Dune house, and most you know, of the houses that burned were not so in our district. No, not right now. No, they are not. But but they can vote. Right. They would receive their ballot wherever they have their mail for it. Excuse me, how many votes from the Okay, moving on. Uh, it is now time for board discussion. On, Do you need to close? Uh, okay, so we'll close the public hearing. The public hearing is closed. And then we'll have board discussion on the agenda item. Agenda item. And it, because you don't have adequate protest ballots to invalidate, mm -hmm. you can choose to adopt the rates as Raptelis has presented them. You could choose lower rates than has been presented, or you could choose not to increase the rates. Okay. Those are your options. 
So before we choose an option, um, let's ask for comments. Bob, would you like to start? Sure, I can do that. <clears throat> before I get into my um, explanation about why I oppose this, which will be uh, a lengthy and, and serious critique of the issues, I did want to clarify a couple things. Um, and I'm, I am looking forward that perhaps in the future we might be able to uh, sync up on the numbers calculations before the day we're going to vote on things. Um, uh, I calculated all the uh, bills and the percentages based on numbers excluding the fire surcharge. Um, that way you get an apples to apples comparison between now and later because later the fire surcharge will be gone. So the percentages are based on that. Um, the percentages will absolutely change if you include the fire surcharge. I felt that that was not an apples and apples comparison, but apples and oranges. Uh, second of all, regarding um, adopting rates before the budget, I, you know, I, I've done finance for a lot of my career and um, you know, this process of Prop 218 is definitely very, very different because normally uh, you do um, a deal either with revenue forecasts, budgets, but the final plan basically is, um, is, is done as part of a long range financial plan. And that isn't necessarily where you're gonna end up, but it is an indication of what your priorities are, where you're gonna spend money and how you expect to allocate resources. We are not doing that. In fact, I'm, I'm afraid that Director Mahood may be suffering from a logical fallacy and that disasters can happen whether you have a two-year budget or a five-year budget. And you may have to change those budgets, whether it's a two-year or a five-year, when a disaster happens. Everybody understands that. That's, that's not a question. The issue is that if you pass a five-year budget to match the rate increase, you're telling the community what your priorities are that you're committing to. That's a big difference. And we're not doing that here. Um, we're, we're doing a sort of soft kind of, well, we intend to do this, or we, but there's no commitment on the part of the board to do that. In fact, in the plan, 50% of the additional money is slated to go towards increases in operating expenses. We have an agenda item later that will put us on the path to take that back to the 67%, in my opinion, that we've been at for the last 10 years, where the vast majority of the money is not going to where we're emphasizing in the ballot, but rather going to just delivering water to the district. We're on a hamster wheel, folks, and we're not getting off it. And I hope at some, I hope someday that we'll be able to get off that. I have four specific reasons I oppose this rate increase, process, content, spending, and legal. And I'm, I'm critiquing this because this is what I was elected to do. I was very upfront during the campaign, perhaps not to my advantage, about exactly where I come on these kinds of issues. There should have been no question in anybody's mind about that. Um, this critique is not directed at anybody in particular. It is business. I have no idea who did anything other than what the board voted on and what the consultants did. But it is the board's majority for this. Um, I agree that the mailer has significant issues. Um, and I just wanna start with what the mailer looked like when it came in. This is our ballot that we get from the county. This is what you got from the district. There's nothing on here that says ballot. You might kind of see, well, maybe rate increase here if you turn it over. I got a tremendous number of emails from people saying they didn't receive a, a, a ballot. It's very possible that they looked at it and said junk mail and yes. pitched it immediately. Yes. Um, the content also said that there was a stamped envelope included. Yes. Confuse people. Uh, even though something came out of the bill later, it wasn't particularly highlighted. I mean, I went right by it until I went back and looked at it. Um, there was no board review of this content. It, it, and, and the admin committee, which had ample time to prepare for this, didn't seem to be as deeply involved in it as, as I was expecting, given that we, we um, delegated that authority to them. 
so the, the mailer was itself a really bad um, look for the district, in my opinion. We also held a tight 45-day window during the worst weather time of the year in our valley. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been without power for substantial parts of that time, most recently about five days. Um, this is why I did not want us to send the ballot out during the holiday season, during this weather. We could have shifted a little bit. It wouldn't have made a, a serious difference. Um, I, I, so these are issues around process that hopefully we'll take some lessons learned on this um, and do better next time. The, the last thing that really bothered me is the consultant's final report wasn't finalized until last Friday. That report should have been available to the community before then. I know the slides were out there, I get that, but slides and report are two very different things. And I think that was a, a big disservice to the community. The next thing is content. There was some real misleading information in the, in the mailer, in my opinion. This is what you are going to focus on as a recipient of that, average. What do you think about average, typical? You think bell-shaped curve, everybody's kind of around that average. Folks, the, 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 the plain matter is only 7% of the bills sent out in 2023 were at six units. 7% is not average, it's not typical, it's not any of the synonyms. It is in fact the exact opposite of that. And for this to go out in this fashion, to me, sort of relates to something I found online around uh, 2021 court decision, Florin County Water District, where the court said the district had provided only hypothetical examples of how a ratepayer's charges would increase over time in a hide the ball approach. To me, this sort of borders on hiding the ball. Yep. That is, it doesn't really reflect what the reality is, which is this, most bills, four units and under. 59% as a matter of fact. That, that is a serious problem. And I think we as a district, we as a board, need to be more transparent with people. I think everybody here I heard recognizes that some increase might be required sometime under some circumstances, um, in some format, what have you. But this isn't it. It's totally unfair for that. Thank you. I'm not done. Um, <laughs> so the the other part of this is that twenty five percent of the bills are in the eight the five to eight unit range, and eighteen percent are above that. In fact, when you look at the first year, fifty four percent of the money that's expected to be raised is coming from people under four units. And this is if you take the, 2023 bills and calculate them using 2024 rates. And in the future, Brian, I do hope that we're able to collaborate in this because if your numbers aren't the same as my numbers, that's definitely an issue. But setting that aside, the real issue is that information needs to be presented to the community at the start of the process, not at the end. And that is a failure on our part. I'm, I, I like a number of people have commented, I'm very sad for our seniors, people on fixed income, people that can serve. I know this is gonna feel like a punishment. It's gonna feel like a regressive tax. It's not fairly levied across the community. I can't do anything about it. There weren't enough votes to do that, but I agree with you on that. The next issue is spending. Folks, this is where I've been, and the board here is absolutely sick, and they've told me this in the past of hearing this, but I'm going to say it again. There's nothing in the mailer that commits the district to do anything with respect to the money that they raise, regardless of how they say they're going to use it. I have the marketing material from the last two rate increases. It says we're going to spend it on infrastructure. Guess what? One third of the money went to infrastructure. My view is two thirds should go, not, not one third. So in effect, because there's no commitment, the board's saying, trust us, love to, but we can't based on what's happened over the last two rate increases. And there's a gentleman that spoke that goes back even farther than I do. 
And it's the same result. Every time we say X, but we spend it on Y. And that's not right. If in fact, the board's priority is to spend money on operating expenses to the tune of 67%, then they need to come up with a plan that deals with the fact that we need to be spending at least $6 million a year on infrastructure just to stay even, not counting, catching up for deferred maintenance like our steel tanks that are not being maintained and they're well past their life. And there's not a plan to deal with them at all in any of this material that came out. Therefore, five years from now, it is a high probability that we will be asking the same <coughs> questions yet again. And that is just simply not the way to run an agency like this that has long-term financial issues that it's simply not dealing with. The fact of the matter is, your bill for a four for a four unit customer has gone up 150 percent since 2013. Operating expenses have doubled in, a, in that time period, a 10 year period, at a time when inflation was about 25 percent for that 10 year period. Four times inflation. I don't mean to be mean, but everybody that would look at that, and I certainly can tell you, in my business, if someone walked in with that kind of an increase, I would be saying. Mr. Manager, Mrs. Manager, what did you spend the money on? What benefit did we get for that? And how can you justify that kind of increase going forward if there isn't quantitative documented benefits? I have been asking for that for years. It is not coming, and I don't think it will. Um, as a community, you should be very upset about that because I guarantee you, you run your household budget on how are we spending the money and what's the value for it. Um, so, so we've got a problem there with how we're spending the money. The other part of this is what's not said. There are in fact steel tanks that are not being maintained. The last number I did on that was about six and a half million based on numbers I got from district staff. That was about three years ago. I guarantee you it's at least 50% higher, if not more, particularly since when tanks aren't maintained, they do deteriorate over time to the extent they have to be repaired, which drives up costs of maintenance. Um, we have no plan here for how to build up real cash reserves. I am really disappointed in a graph that shows cash with a reserve line, implying that in fact that cash is reserves. That is totally misleading to the community. Our cash reserves are not where they need to be to withstand the next disaster, um, at least not at this point. Maybe we get some FEMA money in, they might be. But we had about a four to 4.4 million cash reserve for before the CZU fire. We spent almost 4 million of that responding to the fire. If we hadn't worked so hard from 2018 to that time to build cash reserves, we would not have had the cash to respond. I, our cash reserve should be somewhere in the five to 8 million range. According to our policy, we have no plan to get there. Our pension liability using a reasonable rate of return, not the rate of return that the state pension fund says that they should get, but something that actually matches reality, we're facing about an $8 million shortfall in our pension reserve as of right now. There is no plan to address that. And we keep paying 7% interest, which I guess nowadays isn't as bad, but when interest rates were at 2%, that was basically loan sharking. But that's what we had to pay to the state every year in order to pay interest on our debt. No plan to deal with that. Unfortunately, given where we are today, the real plan is lather, rinse, repeat. Five years from now, we're all gonna be sitting here, I hope, and basically having the same conversation. I hope we have a different conversation. I hope the model's followed. There's absolutely no evidence that that's gonna be, that's gonna happen. And I'm concerned that these mounting liabilities are gonna very well affect our property values. Folks, this is not a choice between either we pass this rate increase or we're big basin water. Those, those are two extremes. The reality can be very much in between there with a reasonable plan, long-term financial planning, and a stable water system that doesn't have the issues uh, that regrettably the big basin water company does. 
And the last topic has to do about legal issues. Um, I, I have a fiduciary responsibility based on my oath of office to ask some of these questions. I have not gotten very clear responses at this point. I don't believe that the um, consultant's report adequately addresses the quantitative costs associated with tiered rates. <coughs> they said, well, you know, the tanks and, and, and pipes and all the rest of that, because they're for fire flow, aren't calculated. But guess what, guys? That's why we build the tanks the way that they are. We aren't doing them for capacity reasons, I guarantee you. A lot of our pipes in this district are two and four inches. But when we install new pipe, we put in six to eight for fire flow not for capacity. And so I don't know if any of this has been adjudicated in court. The Capistrano decision, I guess, is still the most recent one. It was pretty clear about what they needed to do. I asked a whole ton of questions uh, for about the, the law on this. I've received zero answers. Folks, if I can't get the answer, you're not gonna get the answer. But we need to be able to say very clearly why we believe that this report passes the uh, requirements of Capistrano. I, I don't see it. I could be wrong. I'm not an attorney, but I do read contracts a lot during the day, and, and I do financial analysis. I don't see it. I see hand-waving at this point around tiered rates. Now, mind you, whether or not tiered rates are a good public policy is a separate question. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're following the law and that you have backup for that that we have, in fact, a legal opinion or a legal decision that says the AWW M1 rates that are used nationwide, in fact, fulfill Capistrano requirements. I don't have that. I asked the question. There's no answer. And we're not going to get an answer before, I don't believe, before this vote takes place. Folks, I think that is, again, shortchanging the community with respect to our fiduciary responsibilities, certainly mine. Um, and, you know, Raf Tellis does say that they would defend the district in the case of any kind of Prop 218 challenge. Great. Had they defended one sex successfully that used the, uh, the methodology that they used? I asked that question, and I did not receive an answer. So to vote in favor of this without understanding the legal aspect of this, to me, is something that I couldn't do even if I was in favor of the rates because I can't stand behind it and my oath of office. So I wanna close out by, because I, I know it's been very long. I appreciate everybody uh, listening to me. I'm grateful to the community for supporting me so I can bring these issues to light. I understand it's a minority opinion, but as I said earlier today on a, on a Facebook post, it's important that the community engage in this debate. Whether or not you're in favor or against, Having this debate is important. There is no way in our valley that 100% of the community supports this rate increase. And I'll guarantee you it's probably more than the 1,300 if we actually took it to a positive and vote instead of this sort of stack deck backwards Prop 218 process. Um, this is not about showing loyalty to the district or not supporting the district if you oppose it. In fact, in my opinion, opposing bad financial decisions and bad financial process is the height of the support for the district. I want this district to be on sound financial footing. And at this point in time, it is not. And what's worse, this rate increase will not put it on sound financial footing because we are not addressing the issues that are outstanding with us right now. Those issues don't go away based on this win. In fact, this win opens the spigot to other spending as what happened in the past. There's a word for doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And we are about to engage in that. The bottom line here is that this board and previous boards have shown no desire for long-term financial planning, fiscal restraint on operating expenses, any of this thing. The only way that's going to change, in my opinion, is through either the Prop 218 process, defeating this, which was uh, is a long shot. It's uh, the number of defeats that have happened in the state of California, you could probably count on the fingers of one hand since 1996. But a future board is not obligated to continue with this rate increase in this fashion. So 
in November, you have an opportunity to make your voices known. There will be two board seats open. I appreciate it very much. I appreciate my fellow board members for listening to me. I know it's a lot, but it is important that the community hear this as part of the process. Thank you very much. Can I ask a procedural question? Is it, um, I, I was under the impression that the Brown Act suggests that we should not campaign from the okay. dais, which is what I just heard at the end of the dais. That sounds like a violation of Brown Act. Well, I will, I will withdraw it if it is and apologize profusely to the community and the board for saying so. And, and not do it again in this meeting. I, I think Bob's final statement um, made it pretty clear what his previous comments were, what his comments were really about, which is not addressing substantively the proposal we have in front of us, but setting up something else. Let me just say, address two things first that directly that Bob said. And then I wanna talk about the issues of equity and another topic that I think is really important that people understand um, and that I only learned um, because I was part of this process of um, being on the budget and finance committee. First, um, let me say that Bob saying that he uh, is worried about the legality of what Raft Ellis has done and that he can't get the information he needs about peaking charges. They're laid out in the report. Um, and it's, it's not complicated. You can go and read the report. And it's basically, um, you know, there's no magic here. It's just that there are sort of standard best practices in the industry. I mean, this is, they're doing this all over the country. Every water board has to do this every five years when they set rates. So there's sort of standards of how you figure out what peaking charges and they're explained. What that also means is that we don't have as much discretion as we might in our hearts want to have. Like, for example, Alina says, well, we should give the schools a break, you know, I, you know, or the parks a break. We would love to, uh, but you, you can't do that. You are required um, by the decision to charge people more or less what it costs to deliver the water to them. Okay. Um, and so then um, the, the other thing that Bob says is he kept going on and on about debt. And this has been explained to him multiple times and I don't understand why he doesn't get it. Heather tried very politely. Um, that is that um, the money that we get for debt, we just it just doesn't get thrown into the budget in such a way that uh, we can do whatever we want with it. It is tied to specific capital projects, all of the debt that we've gotten. So what does that do in terms of reserves? It means that if we don't have to spend, if we go out for some amount of debt, whether it's 19 or as Brian said, it might be something smaller. Um, what that does is it relieves money that we might've spent from our water revenues that we get from the charges to spend on other things. And one of those things that we can do is build up our cash reserves. Now, when we talked about this, um, and in fact, one of the things that came up in the Budget and Finance Committee was that Raftalis really wanted um, us to build up our reserves um, um, even faster. The problem with that is if you try to build up reserves really fast, or you try to fix everything that's wrong with the district right now, in other words, addressing the storm damage, or addressing uh, the, the CZU fire, what that means is that all the people that just happen to be owning a house and living here now end up paying for all of this. So for, let me just give you an example because I did this calculation. Say, as Bob says, we're under-reserving on the order of maybe something like $3 million. If we were to try to raise that the same way that we raised the fire surcharge, it would mean that your rates would have to go, everybody's rates would have to go up $30 a month. So that's one alternative. If we want to bring our, our reserves up, that was one way we could have done it. 
The other way you do it is you take out debt for 20 or 30 years and you say, you know, some of the people that are going to benefit from the changes and the, the things that we're doing now that as we replace and as we upgrade, as we replace, more people are going to benefit down the road, you know, I'll be dead, um, but there'll be people moving in and taking my place and they're benefiting. So putting it on a loan makes sense because the beneficiaries are not just the people now. What that means is the cost of this debt is something on the order of about 30 cents a month on your bill, right? So you are paying for these things and helping bring the reserves back, but that's the choice, okay? Is do we hit everybody now? Or do we try to put it down? So that, so that's that's that. Then we get to the question of, of equity, and I know this is really a tough one, um, and it and it has to do with the fact that it, really it has to do with the fact that we're so fantastic at reserving uh, and preserving and, and uh, excuse me, not reserving and conserving. Too many serves. Um, we're great at conserving in this valley. And the median usage, that is 50% of the people use more, 50% use less, is four units a month. It's really small, okay? It's really uh, quite, quite small. And that's partly because we have a lot of households that uh, are only one or two people in it, but it mostly is because we're very good at conserving. So what that means is, is you cannot simply say we're going to give a break to the people that are have one or two units of water that they use because you simply can't raise the revenue you need if you sort of say, well, we're not going to raise the revenue of half of our population. And Bob knows that. Okay. So this is this is not an issue of, you know, it's not an issue of equity. It comes out of the fact that we have half of our people don't use very much water. And if we are going to get the revenue we need, something has to give there. Um, then the, the, the other question of equity is you can stand back and you can say, okay, yes, people that are at the low end are getting a 20% increase, but in fact, it's less than a dollar a day. And so you ask, okay, what is the, uh, you know, what's fair? And what we're doing with this rate increase is in many ways fixing the mistakes that were made in the last rate increase in 2017, when under pressure from the public, they dropped the base rate. It used to be that we were 50% base rate and 50% volumetric rate. So 50% fixed, 50%. We dropped back to 37%. So what that means is that we only had guaranteed that 37%. The unintended consequence, they didn't think it through, was we're so good at conserving that what happened was is that our revenue went down drastically because we shifted this proportion of fixed versus volumetric. And this is one of the main reasons. It's not profligate spending on operating expenses. It's the fact that we undercollected revenue. That's one of the main reasons that we didn't do all the infrastructure things since 2017 that those board members promised you. Okay, so this gets to the question of what is equitable and the, the concept, which is a little bit hard for me to get my head around initially, but it's the concept of ready to serve. What are you paying for when you pay your water bill? You're not, you're, yeah, you're paying for the water, but really what you're mostly paying for is ready to serve. What that means is when you turn on the tap, there will be water there. When you turn on the tap, that water will be clean and healthy, and you don't have to worry about there being a boil notice. When you turn on the tap, there will be enough water to flush your toilets, uh, you know, and take a shower. All right. Um, then the other component of that is, is that there's also enough pressure in the whole system nearby that if your house catches on fire, the fire department can put out the fire. So you're paying for that. So for somebody to say, well, I, I hardly use any water, great, but you'd be pretty upset if suddenly there weren't water there, if your house caught on fire, you would want that. What else are you paying for? You're paying for a staff that works their butts off and is willing to get out there 24 seven under horrible conditions. I mean, I, I remember talking to Rick, I actually told him call the staff in under some of the winter conditions we had because they were out trying to fix breaks. And 
that staff is what fixes breaks quickly um, that allows you to have your water. The other thing that they do is they're the ones that are out there. They were there during the CCU fire going out and by hand, because the electricity was out, <clears throat> shifting valves that allowed Cal Fire to save downtown Boulder Creek. Right. So this is partly what we're paying for is the staff that is prepared to do it needs to be done. So although so the idea of equity is what's fair, we all have to pay a certain amount towards that ready to serve. And the ready to serve component is uh, part of the reason that we see this increase the base charge. It, we haven't actually even gone back to the pre-2017 value. Um, in some ways, for financial reasons, it would actually make it safer if we did, if we went back to that or even higher. Usually 50-50 is what sort of mountainous uh, water districts do, like ours that are mountainous and dispersed over wide areas. Um, so we've dropped to 37. We we're only taking it back to 45. And we did that in part because we knew that the hit would be big, bigger than it is on the lower end users, they'd feel it more. And so we didn't take it back even to the conditions that we were before. So I, I guess I'm sorry. saying it's pretty obvious. Um, And uh, I chaired it. You can blame me for it if you want, but we worked really hard to balance the needs of the district. We pushed back on Raftelis to get a steeper tiering of rates so that the rates would be less for water users and that the rates would be, uh, the amount of uh, bills would hit higher as Brian described on the higher water users. And um, so, uh, I would just say that that's what we did, and you, you know, you can you can uh, vote me out, but you know, next time and you you feel free. But we don't come into this job. We're not paid a lot. Doesn't even pay for my coffee money. Uh, we don't come into it thinking we want to screw over people or charge them a lot. I mean, we we do the best we can, and I think that um, the staff and uh, the budget and finance committee did just that. Thank you. Mark? Sure. Um, I will attempt to keep it short so that we can keep this moving. I will attempt to keep it short uh, in an effort to keep this meeting moving along. Um, I've been involved um, with uh, participating from a board perspective and from the engineering and environmental committee um, throughout this uh, rate study process. I've seen the evolution of the plan. Um, I've seen uh, comments from the board that have caused the staff to make what I thought were positive changes in what they were proposing. I've seen comments from the public that have caused the plan to be changed. One specific was on the initial proposed uh, Boulder Creek wastewater rates, which were initially significantly higher than what's currently in the plan. And staff went back and looked at it and made changes. Um, do we have a perfect plan here? No. Um, I don't know that we could ever get to perfect. Do we have a good plan? I believe so. Um, to one of the points that I heard brought up during public comments um, was related to uh, the debt service. Um, the debt service being at uh, 25%. How can it, how could we as an agency do? Um, it's common for public agencies uh, to do that. Um, we're using the rates that you're going to be paying over the next number of years and taking out a loan against that so that we can more quickly begin to replace some of that aging infrastructure that the staff member who was here was describing uh, with piping underground that's failing. 
We can take out a loan and begin to replace that sooner than waiting to collect the money over a number of years and then taking that much longer um, to get it to get it done. So um, from everything that I've seen, um, the staff is um, and has worked to provide us a reasonable plan here that we can move forward with, and I'm supportive of this. With that, I'll turn it back to Jeff. Um, so uh, I used to work for San Jose Water Company. Can you speak up, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> totally understand. Yeah. Yeah. We're passing the microphone around. <laughs> I used to work for San Jose Water Company, um, which is one of the oldest water companies in uh, the state of California, not to mention the Bay Area. And one of the things that you learn um, when you go to work for a really old water company is that um, people uh, paid for your pipes 100 years ago, right? Because the way that water rates used to work was that you were paying for that ready to serve cost. That was the largest part of your bill was all of the, you were paying for all the pipes and infrastructure that have to be in place and maintained to get the water from where the water is collected and treated to your home, right? And that's our biggest cost. Those are fixed costs. Our two biggest fixed costs are PG&E, Right, because we have to spend a lot of money on energy to pump the water up and over these mountains. And that's why when people say I've compared us to other, you know, rates in the area, I, I need to know what are the geographical and topographical conditions that that water district is operating in? Because if you have to pump water and maintain the pressure up and over mountains like we do, um, you're, you're going to spend more money. In addition to that, we have a larger geographic service area. So we may serve the same number of population as a similarly sized water district, but we're spread out a lot more than a compact water district in a more urban or metropolitan area, which means we need more energy to get the water from where we are to those homes that are the furthest out there in the reaches. So that's a really big cost for us. And guess what? PG&E doesn't ask us when they raise the rates. They just raise it and we just have to pay those increased rates like all of you do. This year, we also renegotiated a budget with our union members, many of whom, most of whom, frankly, live here in this valley, valley and pay all the increased costs that we're all paying. And they need to be able to earn a wage to continue to live here. Part of this wage increase or part of this rate increase will go to meet those conditions of that newly renegotiated contract that we entered into with our staff earlier this year and that we're now obligated to maintain. We're obligated to pay them at the rate that we agreed to pay them. So we've got those two big costs that are fixed in our budget, right? We have to pay our, our staff and we don't have very many of them. So it's not like we can just cut them. And we have to pay our energy bills and our chemical bills and our fixed costs. We got to buy pipe. That's a fixed cost. And that's how we get the water to you. Well, unfortunately, about uh, 30 to 40 years ago, a change in the thinking at the state of California was implemented to say, you know what, we want to tell everybody to conserve water. So we're going to flip-flop the way that you charge people. And instead of charging them for your biggest costs, your fixed costs, you're going to charge them more for the volume costs. So they, they, what they said was, you're going to take some of your fixed costs and you're going to move them into the variable cost of your water rate. So things that we have to pay are built into the amount of water that you use. Well, you use different amounts of water throughout the year. During the winter, you use less. So we get less money. And during the summer, you use more. And if you want to cut back and get rid of your garden, for example, you use even less. Well, as someone said, our business is in water sales. So when you use less money, that means a hit to our revenue, which makes it harder for us to maintain our budget and plan. So all of these reasons are why we looked at these tiered rates and determined that we have to increase the fixed costs to some degree to help balance out the fact 
that you're all a really good group of conservers. We're all a really good group of conservers, but that means your volumetric, your volumetric costs go up and down so drastically through the year that we can't put together a reliable budget and pay our bills on a regular basis and save for all of the capital projects that, that my counterpart down the dais wants us to spend money on and save for our reserves as my counterpart down the dais wants us to do. And if we were to raise rates enough to do all of the things that my counterpart down the dais wants us to do, you'd be seeing a much higher increase than what we're proposing right now. So it's a little bit confusing to hear that, that we should be doing these other things that will raise our rates at the same time being told that we shouldn't raise our rates to do those things. It's, it's an impossible condition to set up. And so for those reasons, and for all of my past experience, I support this water increase. In the interest of time, I'm going to say that the things I had planned to say have been said. Um, I will only comment that we are here today with the issues that we have today. We have pipes that need to be fixed to repair and replaced, pipes that are too small for fire flow. We have tanks. We still have some redwood tanks, for example. We have tanks that need to be uh, changed, upgraded, cleaned. I agree with Bob. We need to be maintaining those tanks better. Um, we have one location in Felton where we're replacing a, a 10,000 gallon tank that's an old tank. And the fire district says, we want you to put in 60,000 gallons or maybe 120,000 gallons. Guess what? A lot more money there. But that neighborhood will have a lot more, uh, a lot more assistance from firefights uh, once that tank is there. Um, we are where we are. Mistakes have been made in the past. No doubt this board will make mistakes here and there. I'm sure we've made some. Um, but we are where we are. We have to look forward. And, and I don't think it's right or fair to hold this board responsible for things that two boards, three boards ago did, commitments they made, and, and circumstances change. It's a fact of life. Circumstances change. So I'm going to support this uh, proposal. And uh, I think I will ask uh, Barbara what the next step is on this. I think we need a motion. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, I move that the board accept the water and wastewater rate study final draft report that was prepared by Rav Tellis. And secondly, adopts a resolution approving updated water and wastewater services rates and rescinds resolution number six, seven, and eight. Was there another one you needed to add? Yes, yes. Uh, resolution, thank you. Resolution number 12, 18-19. Uh, okay, as, as so stated. As so stated. I'll second that. Comments from the public? Comments from the board? I have a couple of quick comments. Um, I want everybody to know about 40%, actually 40 points of the almost doubling in operating expenses came before the pandemic or CCU fire. Um, so that put us, due to the power of compounding, that put us on a path to where we're going now. To say that all of that happened because of the pandemic or, or fire, some of it did, but I back that out on my calculations. So it, it, let, we, we need to make sure when we're doing these that we're actually looking at the real numbers. Folks, I want you, I, I think the, the, there was a couple of comments made that are very true. These can't be solved overnight. But I constructed a 25 year model of the, of the district's um, revenue and operating expenses, adjusting for the fact that Felton and uh, Lompico and Olympia weren't in our district 25 years ago. Operating expenses during that time increased at a rate of about 5.5%. Due to the power of compounding, if we had 
Point of order. Lower this that. Is, this is not if, a comment if, on the if, motion. If we had lowered, this is the reason I'm opposing it. Because if we had lowered that to a number around three to three and a half percent, we would have had thirty million dollars extra if we had assumed the same rate increases. So, um, so we have to get ourselves onto financial planning, and I'm looking forward actually to the board doing that as they say they're going to, because I'm skeptical it's going to happen. Thank you. Any other board comments? Colleen, will you uh, call the vote? Do you allow President the Hill, I've already asked, I, I, I already I asked, asked for public, public comment. comment. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. asked. We, 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 no, she was not up and waiting. We asked for public comment before we asked the board for it. Do you have a right to comment? Regardless, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Just a proof of concept. I believe several of our board members might know what that means. Yes. Yeah. In 2017, the board asked the staff to come up with a budget that was less than 5% increase. They did. It was a lot of complaining. No one lost their job. They were able to fill reserves within about a year and a half. That is the power of compounding. And I believe that's what Bob is saying. None of you have addressed, you only address the increasing the revenue. None of you have addressed the other side. If you can just bend the curve down in spending, that money comes up and you don't have to increase the rate so much. It's a very simple concept. Basic economics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Holly, will you call the vote? President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. It is 9.30 p.m. or 9.20 p.m. Um, I could ask you to be quiet as you leave. There are people on the phone still listening, and we need to continue with the meeting. We still have items on the agenda. That yes. It is time to move on to new business. Um, before we do, um, it's 20 minutes after 9.00. Uh, are there any of those three issues under new business that we wish to table for the next meeting? <laughs> are you saying you want to table all of them or oh, some? I, of I, I move that we table uh, 5A and 5B. Sorry, which ones are those? The changes, changes to the director of finance uh, uh, description, job description, and the change to uh, single monthly meetings rather than two. Uh, and I do that because I think um, the, I, I, f I found the, the memos regarding them a little bit confusing and I think it'll be given the hour hard for Ryan to walk us through those sufficiently. Um, they are not particularly urgent. On the other hand, I think item 5C, we should, we should. so anyway, I move that we table um, 5A and 5B to return to it next that. week. Okay. We need a roll call vote on that. Yes. Uh, any no, comment? there's no comment. No comment. debate. Okay. President Robert Hill. Of order. <laughs> Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We will now proceed to the item 5C compensation study. Uh, Brian, is that, uh, do you want to present that? Sure. Thank you, President Bill. Um, so essentially, this is uh, just a professional service agreement to conduct uh, a salary study, which I believe we um, we brought this to both committee and the board before. I know that also we have two MOUs that you mentioned earlier um, with each of the bargaining units. However, right now the salaries are tied to the CPI um, or cost of living index. And so one of the contingencies or one of the statements in the MOUs is that we would 
use salary study to justify the new salary rates for each of the um, employees in the bargaining units. So maybe a couple things to also point out that this, uh, there's a, let's see, a selection committee of three of us, um, was myself and two of the board members, the two board members who were also on the, the outgoing members of that admin committee. But Budget time, and finance. Budget and finance, excuse me. Um, myself, I'm not in either bargaining unit, so I felt that was the only staff member that wasn't, um, didn't have a conflict of interest. So then having two board members to help select it seemed appropriate. Um, and so the other, I guess the other thing is, is what the consultant had brought up is that there's uh, to put together a working group, which would include one board member, one representative from each of the bargaining units, myself and, and uh, a finance manager and our acting finance manager, because then there's some transparency through the process. It's not like there's a study and then we're bringing it back to these bargaining units six months later, or four months later. So there's steps along the way where we're getting by. Um, lastly, I plan to ask along with the salary study is that we look at salaries for specific positions that we don't have or need to kind of get a hone in on a new salary for. So there's business and customer services supervisor, uh, contract and reporting specialist, and an associate engineer. And those are positions at the moment. So we'd like to have salary survey cover those. And this doesn't mean we're opening and establishing those positions, only having the option that we now know what a fair salary is to offer, should we decide to do that. And the other one is finance manager. And the finance manager position, that's, we haven't had a salary for that for some time, and we haven't used that title in that position. Um, one of the other, one of the items we tabled was about that, but um, be it as it may, is, just looking at it from that standpoint of having a finance manager rather than the director of finance and business services. Um, so with that, I believe there may, there was pointed out that there was something in the agreement that needed to be changed, but I will point out that the recommended motion that authorizes me as the interim general manager to execute um, extensions and non-substantive changes, and we consider that change a typo, which was rather than having the pre having it commence within 100 days and 80 days, that it's completed in 180 days. So, yes. Anyway, I found that. Good. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, I don't have the recommended motion right in front of me. Does somebody have? I it? have it right here. Okay. Okay, I move that the board directs the interim general manager to enter into an agreement with Gallagher Benefit Services Incorporated for an amount not to exceed $37,000 to perform a compensation study with a $3,000 contingency and authorizes the interim general manager to execute extensions and or non-substantive modifications to the agreement as necessary. I second that with the um, minor amendment that uh, the general manager. Commence goes to complete. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they need to go to public, public comment. Yeah. Yes. Public comment. Point of order. The board should be. Point of order. Uh, should the board go first? Yes. Or should okay. we go? We'll let the board go first. Yes. Yes. Hang on one second. Generally. Yeah. This, this Generally. seems to move around. Right. Well, I think it depends on sort of the the, item is. the, the big yeah. items, yeah. right? Yeah. Why don't you start public comment at this end? Okay. So Gail. Um, I, I would just say that I um, I think both all three of us thought that this company that we chose was by far the best of the ones uh, that we interviewed. Um, and uh, we liked the way they had this sort of iterative process where they would come back and involve um, the members of staff so that we don't, as, as Brian said, end up with something at the end that nobody agrees with or they're grumbling, well, you didn't check this or whatever. And I also like the way Brian um, included some potential changes of, of uh, in terms of how we would structure the uh, budget manager and then the business services part of things and also to other 
potential things to look at. I thought that was that was smart. Um, so I'm in favor of this. Um, I, I mean, I support the recommendation as put forward. I'm not familiar with this organization, but I trust the ad hoc committee that made the determination and we've made a commitment to the staff to do this study. So I support this. Okay. Okay, so um, talking about the organization that we're talking about contracting with, one of the most impressive things was that they have a long and impressive list of clients oh, right. that are government agencies, uh, public districts, water districts. Um, they know our business well. Including little districts yes, in difficult districts topographical areas. Yeah, they, they know our yeah. business well and they know, know uh how businesses like and organizations like this are structured. Uh, the other two candidates, uh, not nearly so well. Okay. Mark? Um, I did not have the opportunity to interview the firm. So the only thing I'm basing my comments on are what was presented to us in the agenda packet. Mm -hmm. uh, what they provided to us appeared to be a bit of a cut and paste yes. uh, with the lead off being, uh, dear Ms. Reed, Yes. <laughs> Addressed to Rick Rogers. Uh, not a good way to start off. Um, their proposal says it's valid. Actually, for I think that was correct. Uh, not from what I saw. Kendra Reed. Was I'm not sure when the Kendra uh, Reed. I mean, I'm Kendra not sure Reed. when the timing of this was. Okay, yeah, that was correct. That this has been hanging something. far for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's not, all right. Okay. Um, it's uh, valid for 90 days, is what they say. Uh, have we confirmed with them that we're still okay with the pricing that they provided us? Yes. Uh, given that we, okay, good. And I would expect that they would say yes, but um, we we checked references then based on that long list of what they provided to us here. Um, I did not check references. Okay. No. Um, but if if the group of three were doing a comparative between this one and the other two, uh, then the proposals were di yeah. distinctly different, markedly different. Yes. Okay. Um, and did you have the chance to meet Maggie, the no. project? Uh, I'm, I'm not saying face to face, but. No. In any of the four. we did interview uh, uh, what would effectively be your boss. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, those are the questions that mm -hmm. I have on this. Uh, All right. Questions. Uh, question and comment. Um, typically in these sorts of things, I like to either see all the proposals or what would even be better is a summary table of. Um, what the costs were that or what the proposal were and i've talked about this in the past uh, several times it, it allows at a board level to be able to look at summary information so um were the what were the costs for future sense and ralph anderson did i miss them in the agenda item they weren't there the highest was sixty thousand. yes and then the other one was around 24 i believe yes. okay so was was ralph anderson the 24 or was are they were they the 60. They were the lower one. Okay. Because, I mean, Ralph Anderson does have mm -hmm. a little more than a passing yeah. familiarity with us. Um, okay. So, um, so interestingly, Gail and I put together a matrix. Yeah, our And then we separately, separately scored them. Fabulous. And that would have been a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. We did. <laughs> Brian did <laughs> ask us to fill out such a table. And, yes. and yeah. so... Well, that, that, that actually would have been a great thing to yeah. put in uh, as a summary sort of thing. That's typically yes. what I ask my managers to do when they're evaluating things. What, what was curious about this was we evaluated them separately on a 100-point scale, I think it was, and we both came in within like five points on these guys. Well, I mean, that, yeah. that's, okay. that's great. Um, uh, so, but in, in terms of board operations, there's, yeah. there's at least a a way that we should be going about this. So my comment on this is I, I'm gonna I'm gonna vote against this. Um and, and it really has to go back with sort of my opposition to the the, the whole process here uh from, from the start. Um you know we negotiated contract um 
before establishing what our budgets were. Anyway, it, it's, it's a bit of a mess in that regard. But the main reason I'm uh, opposing this is that I do believe that the salary study will put us on the path to getting us back to um, about two thirds of the money being spent on operating expenses um, or effectively status quo where we are now, um, which doesn't help our district one bit at all in terms of addressing things. Um, the other thing that I don't like about this is this is going to have nothing to do with the market. It's basically we go to agencies and we everyone ratchets each other up over a period of time, which is completely dis, disconnected from any kind of market evaluation. Um, so, I, you know, this this is very similar to the staffing study we did a while back and all the rest of it. it it's relatively preordained. We're only talking about what the uh, percentage range is, is going to be. Um, so for that reason, I, I will vote against it. Public comment. I have a question. I'm hearing do you want to spend money to look at the study. What's the one or two key outcomes you want out of that? As a layperson, I can't track exactly we, what you're looking okay. for. So we committed to do it. Our, our labor contract with our employees has a clause in it which says that we will do such a study and we will maintain salaries at a particular percentile ranking versus similar agencies. So it's going to be looking at rankings of, of a similar agency. Yes, yes. They will and be doing the comparison. And how we, how we compare. Okay. And Thank that's, you. that was one of the terms that our union uh, and people have consisted upon in the contract. <clears throat> All right, my name is Ben Beasley. I'm an employee of the Water District. I'm also a ratepayer. Um, a lot of the things I've heard tonight, um, a lot of things are misconstrued, and a lot of people don't have all the facts. So a lot of people don't do the research for themselves. As a ratepayer, I'm I was against the the rate increase. Uh, just throwing that out there. I lost my home in the fire. Um, I was here every day of the fire working with the water district, providing water for the fire department to, to protect everyone else's homes uh, in the meantime. With this rate going through, I'm gonna have a hard time paying my bill. You know, it's not just the water, you know, the gas has gone up, food's gone up, everything's gone up. pg and &E just went up. It's been horrible timing for most people. I know we're well past that in the conversation. I just wanted to give you a little pretense to it. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I don't normally speak uh, in, in front of public, you know, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Can, can I just add something, Jeff, to, to yeah. sort of address in part what he's saying? I, I think Jamie brought this up earlier is that we, we need to pay our um, our employees, you know, for what so they what they do. Yeah, yeah. Right and and I sure. think that one of the reasons to answer your question earlier. Point is of order. What what part of the um, uh, meeting are we in? Is it public comment or is it board comment? I was just I was going to answer this question of why we were doing point it. Point of order. This compensation study is something that's been put off for years, for a long time. Everybody thinks that we make some gross, huge amount of money. Maybe the higher ups do, maybe they don't. But I work with my boots on the ground every day, and I don't make that kind of money. I'm struggling to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. The inflation has gone up everywhere. Comparing us to other districts, you will very quickly find that we are grossly underpaid compared to any other district with the field staff work that we do. We are the jack of all trades. We do anything and everything. We, you try to compare us to another district, good luck. Most districts are curb and gutter. Most districts are flat. Most districts are level. You know, the, the things that we deal with, the things that we go through every day, and then the grading from the public because of everything that you guys put into action every day is, is a real struggle. So thank you guys for finally acknowledging this compensation study. Maybe everybody doesn't understand it, but for somebody like me, I am working every day to keep your guys' water going, and I can't pay my bills. So... That's why I'm here tonight. I can't pay my bills, but I'm here and I'm trying. Please go through with the compensation study. It's well worth it. You are all gonna quickly find 
We have been underpaid for years in field staff. Thank you. Mr. Ferris Felton. I want to take a page out of his book. I went on my own to look at the wage comparison between our district and six other districts in the state. And I, and I did a perfect, I did a specific job of looking at topography, connections, size of the of district, pipelines, everything, tanks, everything. Uh, but I also looked at salaries and it was very interesting for me because it wasn't at all what I expected. When you look at the, and I divide it into two pieces, the technical side and the, 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 the typical job side. Technical side, field service workers, the plant treatment operators. Technical side, customer service, HR, finance, things like that. What I found was, it was interesting. We compared very well on the technical side to other districts like us around the state. If anything, we were below, the, was, he's right. Mm -hmm. On the other side, we were paying quite a bit more than what other districts were paying. So I have a, a question. Did you look at any option other than having a single person do the rate study and compare it just to other water districts? Because here, here's, my, here's my comment. When I worked in, in biotech for years, we used something called the Radford survey. It was nationwide, hundreds of companies participated. Everybody, paid, you had to supply your own data to be part of the, of the total. And I never, ever in 40 years found anybody that could, could challenge that survey in terms of rates and, and, and uh, job descriptions and, and, and job ranges. So why do we need to have somebody compare us to other districts for common jobs that many, many companies do? Customer service is almost any company. You can, and the job is the same. The product is different, but the job is the same. So why not use the Radford survey or most of the employees? I think it was about two thirds, one third that I looked at. If you look just at the, at the plant service workers and field service workers, it was about one third. And the rest of the district was about two thirds, roughly. So would that save some money maybe? And it can actually give you a better survey because you have a much bigger end for those, those common jobs. Last comment is again. I want to say dollars. I think we should. I, I guess I I was just point of order. To, sorry, no, never mind. I don't I don't want to interrupt you. you get ten seconds more for her. You had talked about uh, the um, uh, those positions that you're going to look at, even though we don't have a person filling the position currently. Again, I would like to to say I think you should be looking at a quality professional. Look at the other districts around us and even beyond our county and very, very few of the big districts do not have a professional quality person on staff. Thank you. What does he mean by that? Do we have anyone online? We do not have anybody online looking okay. to comment. So, we've had a motion, we had it seconded. Holly, would you call, we had comments, would you call the roll? President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Motion passes. I didn't see any consent. We didn't. So. so just talk about the letters. Uh, there's no consent agenda tonight. And no district reports. Two written communications. We had a letter to the board from Eileen Murray and a letter to the board from Dick Lemon. And I will be responding to those tomorrow. Tomorrow. Excuse me. Are you responding as an individual board member or on behalf of the board? On behalf of my personal position. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So it is okay to respond to these kind of letters as individual board members. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Thank you. So long as you make it clear that you're doing it as an individual board member. In my case, as the president of the board, you know, it was addressed basically to me. So. Okay, great. Thank you. You're supposed so, um, that, that's not what the board policy manual says. Is that not what the board yeah. policy manual says? No, you're supposed to refer things like that to the district the staff. general manager or staff. Okay. So, an interesting question. Well, typically, that's we have right. typically, I don't believe we have responded to yeah. letters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whether we should or not is a different thing. And we will refer those to you, Ryan. Does, does get for, we action. take the first shot. Yeah. So if you like, we will leave it up. Yeah, please. I see no other business on the agenda. Meeting is adjourned. Uh, time is 941. <laughs>